Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Alhamdulillah, we begin with the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. We praise Allah, the Lord of the worlds, and we send a complete peace and blessings upon our Sayyid, our Master Muhammad ibn Abdullahi wasalam, and his family and his companions. We pray that Allah be pleased with the elite from among the Tabi'een, the second generation of Muslims, the right acting scholars, the four mujtahid imams, and all of those who follow them until the day of judgment. Ameen. Alhamdulillah, before we dive, right into our topic, I want to remind our family, which is all of you, to like the video. That means if you're on YouTube, hit that thumbs up button. If you're on Facebook, press like. Do that as soon as you come. Please, 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 please. Also, share, share it on your page. If you want Twitter, tweet it. Let everyone know that we're here and how they can join the conversation and interact with us. And I want to remind us all of the commitment we made to each other financially. We try not to mention it a lot because we committed to each other. And so we should know what we have committed to every week, $500, at least a minimum of $10 each should cover that for us. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see the different ways in which you can support our efforts. Alhamdulillah. Tonight, the topic or theme for our discussion is addicted to Wahhabism. Addicted to Wahhabism. And for those of you who don't know who we are, I'm Naeem Abdullah, the Imam of Masjid al Mukmin in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Next to me off screen is Imam Amin Muhammad of Masjid Muhammad of Atlantic City, New Jersey. And last but definitely not least, on the bottom of your screen, but definitely not under us, definitely not under myself, is Imam Fahim Lee of the Kuba School and Islamic Center, Camden, New Jersey, a.k.a. the Imam of the Boom Bap. Make no mistake, this arrangement, how it is on the screen, is by design. I'm on the bottom because I'm on the bottom. <laughs> now, I don't believe him. What they say now, that's cat. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. I want to welcome all of you who are who are joining us. Alhamdulillah. I think it's important to begin. Uh, anytime we have discussions, conversations, especially when we're going to be using a lot of terminology 
that may mean something different to whoever hears it, it's important that we define the words that we're going to be using. See, Malika said, nah, you holding them up, Imam uh, Fahim. See, you holding us up. She, she understands. Come on, I got an image to uphold, you know. I'm out here light-skinned, man. They think I'm soft. I can't be out here caught crying, man, looking like Drake and them, man. <laughs> <laughs> Allah, don't, like. don't make me cry. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So before we dive into our conversation, I want to uh, discuss the term Wahhabi. Matter of fact, I remember that I put together a definition for this. Let me see if I can pull it up right quick. Probably not. Maybe so. Okay, here's the definition. Wahhabi, used to identify the followers of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, who died 1792 CE or 1206 Hijri calendar, during his lifetime and after his death. Meaning that term is used to identify their followers during his lifetime, even and those who followed him after he, that he had passed. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab came from a traditional Hanbali Muslim family, i.e. they were Ahlu Sunnah or Jama'ah. In other words, they were proper Sunni Muslims, the family he came from. He broke from that tradition after being influenced by the writings of Ibn Taymiyyah, who died 728 after Hijra or uh, 1328 CE. He then formulated a new creed based primarily on Ibn Taymiyyah's teachings, and he also added a few of his own innovations. This creed, this new creed, excuse me, which contradicts that of Ahl Sunnah Tiwal Jama'ah, is characterized by literal interpretation of Allah's divine attributes, giving Allah human or bodily attributes, which in Arabic you call taqsin, putting Allah in a place and likening him to his creation. The Wahhabi creed is characterized by dividing Allah's oneness, Tawheed, into three parts. Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah, and Tawheed al asma wa sifat which means oneness of Allah's Oneness of the Lordship of Allah, oneness of the worship of Allah, and oneness of the names and attributes of Allah, respectively. The modern day Wahhabiyya, or the not modern day Wahhabi, now call themselves Salafi. <clears throat> I think it's important that we establish that and that we mention that because when sometimes when people hear the term Wahhabi, they are thinking that you are dissing them or using it, using it as a pejorative, like an insult. And that's not the case. In Islam, you have many examples of people, I mean, of methodologies that are named after the people who codified. For example, Ahlul Sunnah, with regards to the belief system, they are either Ashari or Maturidi. Ashari is after a person, Abu Hassan al Ashari. Maturidi is after a person, Abu Mansur al Maturidi. The four thick schools, the four schools of uh, outward practice or fiqh. Maliki, that's named after a person. Imam Malik. Shafi. School is named after a person. Imam a Shafi. Muhammad Ibn Idris a Shafi. The Hanafi school is named after a person. Imam Abu Hanifa. Nu'man bin Thabit. 
the Hanbali school is named after a person, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. May Allah be pleased with all of them. And so we can go on and on and on and on with this. So in Islam, when a leader or a person or an imam uh, comes along and he puts in that much work or he codifies something, that thing, even though he didn't create it, gets named after him. And also, uh, as Bashir mentioned in the comments here, scholars call them that as well. The scholars call them that. So this is not somebody, This is we're not people coming two, three hundred years later giving them somebody uh, a name, trying to give them a, a bad name. It's not like when you were in school and somebody wanted to call you a name and say, oh, you fat or oh, you ugly. Or, no, this is not that. And don't allow people to trick you into thinking it's that. That's a the uh, a tactic of deflection. So as we mentioned in our definition, Wahhabism identifies a methodology, particularly with creed, with the belief system, even though it goes it's more than that. But we mentioned uh, some of its hallmarks already. I make I see someone in the comments. Uh, asking you explain. We summarized it already a few minutes ago, inshallah. So when someone wants to become Muslim, when someone wants to become Muslim, nobody says, hey, you know, I want to become a Wahhabi or hey, I want to become uh, this or that. No, they want to become Muslim. They want to become Muslim. But when we come into Islam, especially our people, let's say our people, who I'm talking about, black folks. We just finished having a class, so I might repeat some things to y'all. I think it's important that we define things. When we're talking about black, black Muslims, who are we talking about? Black Muslim, this term refers to those Muslims of African descent who have ancestors who were subjected to the European slave trade. Thus, they were kidnapped from their homelands, had their lineages and cultures systematically erased from their individual and collective memories. Many of their African forefathers were Muslim, and some were not. Because of the break or disconnect in their lineages, many of these Muslims are recent converts. Large numbers of them have been embracing Islam for decades without them being the targets of systematic dawah efforts. It is assumed and even really proven by many historians that this phenomena, this phenomena is the result of the supplication, the dua of their Muslim forefathers who were forced to completely abandon or hide their Islam. These Muslims live primarily in Western or European nations, such as the United States, the United Kingdom, or the Caribbean. Sometimes they are referred to by other names or descriptors, such as African-American Muslims. This black Muslim identifier should not be confused with the same term as it was used in the 1960s to refer to the group known as the Nation of Islam or the NOI. So when we're talking about black Muslims, this is who we're talking about when I use the term black Muslim. So as many of our people, black Muslims are returning to Islam, the religion that was the way of life and the religion that was taken from our forefathers, we find ourselves often the attack, uh, uh, the target of conscious, of efforts to make us or have us be Muslim or Muslim, but Muslim in name, but not Muslim in reality. Muslim, but not Muslim. So, Black folks, 
a lot of us have contracted the disease of Wahhabism. Some of us know it, some of us don't know it. Some of us know it, some of us don't know it. And all of us who are not aware, we think this is proper Islam. This We think this is the Islam that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with. And we were targeted for this. We were targeted for this. I just want to mention a few ways that we were targeted. And then I will pass the mic. Many of us, and I don't know why every time I come online and I make ref, I make mention of it. I wanted to show the uh, show an, uh, an example of that, but I don't have it in front of me. Maybe when one of the other emails starts speaking, I can dig it up. But uh, many of us, even way before the 1990s, way before the 1990s, many of us were taught Wahhabi Islam in the guise of Islam. For example, many of us learned our basics of, of Islam in a book uh, normally translated as the fundamentals of Islam or Mubadi Islam. In the name of the author, the Kunya or the, you know, Abu such and such, Abu so-and-so was given Ibn, then the name of his grandfather. So the name Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab wasn't used. But in fact, the author of the book was Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab. And I'll give y'all ex an example of what I'm talking about. How many of you can remember the first time we had I believe it was the first time because we had him here twice. The first time we had our beloved Imam Asim Abdul Rashid, who has since passed, may Allah have mercy on him, on this platform, on the Black Imam's Roundtable. How many of you remember that? Imam Asim Abdul Rashid, Rahimahullah, from Philadelphia. We had him on here twice. How many of you remember that? Abdul Kareem, you remember. Imari remembers. Hija Stacy remembers. Good. So some of y'all remember. Do you remember when we were in, in the part of the discussion, when we were talking about some of the early educational influences of the Dar, the Dar Islam movement? Do you remember? And he was making the point that they were not Wahhabis and they weren't uh, uh, learning from Wahhabi books. And then he mentioned one of the names of the books that they were learning from. And it was this book that I mentioned. The Fundamentals of Islam. But they gave him another name. Do anybody remember the name? This is off the top of my head. I think, I think it's uh, Abu Suleiman. At to me, yeah, that's what it was. I think Abu Suleiman at Tamimi, uh, Sheikh al Islam, or something like that. They, they name, right? But in fact, that person is Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. So many people learn their basics of Islam from that book or other books with that name, not knowing that the author was Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. And I see Farouk, he tagged Akil Fahad. I kill Fahad ha, has in his pictures a picture of the example of the book that I'm talking about. So I make that point to give one example to show us how even before the 1990s, we were being groomed and primed for Wahhabism subtly on the under, on the sneak tip, 
on the down low, being primed and groomed for Wahhabism. And then by the time the 1990s come around, there's an explosion of students coming back from Saudi Arabia. with the Wahhabi creed. And with that, they took on a new name. They began to call themselves Salaf. And so for all of you who joined late or, or you're not informed, when we're talking about Wahhabis, we are talking about people who call themselves Salaf. So they themselves would object to be being called Wahhabi. But they are in fact Wahhabi. They follow the creed, the belief system formulated by Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. And so they had a hard dawah push in the 1990s. And they got control over many masajid. And then after that, they not only got control over many masajid, they became the main, the main source of information or teaching in institutions. They began to flood the hospitals and the prisons as chaplains and be, be involved in MSAs and all that kind of stuff. And so many of us, because this was our introduction to Islam, we may come to learn that, hey, wait a minute, something, something ain't right with this thing. Something's not right with this thing. And so we know something's off, but we're still addicted to it in one way or another. Even those of us who don't claim to be Salafi or don't claim to be Wahhabi, some of us are still addicted to it. And I want to give some examples, but I want to pass the mic around, so I don't want to hog the mic. So I don't know who's going to go next. But this is uh, our introduction to our discussion tonight. And I feel like I talked already too long. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashruful anbiya wa mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Habibina al-Mustafa, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam, wa mene tabi'ahum bi ihsani ila yawm al-deen wa ba'd. Alhamdulillah, we'd like to welcome you all to tonight's uh, show. And, um, and following up with the genius is going to be a hard thing to do. Uh, uh, you know, Imam Amin mentioned on, uh, first of all, welcome everybody to tonight's uh, uh, discussion, inshallah. And um, as I was, you know, taking it before I begin my, I'm, I'm doing like a little presentation tonight, you know, because as I was doing, you know, taking the temperature on this topic, you know, um, you know, talk to some people, whenever we talk about this issue of, you know, uh, Wahhabia, you know, we are looked at as like the bad guys, you know, or the antagonist, you know what I mean? Like we're starting trouble. But this issue is very important because especially where we're located, we're surrounded with these people who are propagating this uh, illness and people are becoming addicted to it, you know? This stuff is like lean for some people, <laughs> you know, mashallah. So uh, we don't want, we and um, as Imam Amin mentioned this morning, this is not about entertainment. This is about education, you know, and clarification. And sometimes in the midst of clarifying and educating, you know, things ain't going to be pretty, you know, and uh, we're not intentionally trying to make it ugly, but, you know, truth is truth, you know, inshallah. So um, I'm, I'm ready to do my presentation, Imam. Do I just. Uh... OK. So you can see the screen, I, we labeled it uh, addicted to Wahhabism. So this is a presentation. Um, I think I could move to the next slide. So here is a psychological definition of what is addiction. So they said that when you talk about any addiction, whether it's through drugs, alcohol, 
gambling status. It says the common denominator of all addictions is continued use despite the development of negative consequences. Continued use despite the development of negative consequences. And I think that fits in in what we're talking about because even though people who have been exposed to Wahhabia, whether they know it or they don't, it has had negative consequences. Some of you can uh, attest to it. When you are engaged with these people, they make you feel isolated. You feel like your attack is on the Muslims. You don't feel connected. And people who are uh, in, uh, embedded in that thing, you know, they start looking at the Muslims with disdain, looking at the Muslims with bad thoughts, looking at the Muslims as if they commit shirk and bid'a, and this is what their foundation is. And one of the main things is that they make the Muslims feel like uh, they don't know Tawheed. And that is the basic thing when you enter to Islam. You know, no Muslim, no Muslim understands anything except when they, when they take shahad, except that there is no deity except the law, God Almighty, right? And then this other quote I took, it says, in the grand scheme of things, addiction is considered an attempt, a non-productive attempt to solve a problem. It offers relief from shyness, relationship difficulties, shortage of opportunities, losses and failures of any kind and much more. And so at this point, this is why I want to interject one of the, uh, the drawbacks of us, of us as Ahl Sunnah, where we have fell short in carrying the baton, you know, that we have left a void for these people to fill. And then they target people who are shy, who have anxiety issues, who have, you know, they have problems with their self worth and self validation. They don't feel welcome. They have relationship difficulties. You know, there isn't, they have a, uh, they don't, as Imam Amin was mentioning this mo morning, there is not an opportunity to be exposed to the truth, you know, because of the propaganda. And as such, sometimes that's all that's been left, you know, and it has failed people, you know, it has failed people, you know, and then people looking for, you know, when you come into the religion, you're looking for a way of salvation, you're looking for a way of connection, you're looking for a way of changing your life. And if nothing else is there except this Wahhabi propaganda, you know, it is sound appealing. You know, it is sound appealing. You know, so that's the first thing we want to do is identify addictions. Okay. Um, the next thing that um, I put in this slide, I'm not going to make it long, but it's uh, the first thing we should know when we define the terms, we should know Salafia is Wahhabia renamed. Salafia is Wahhabia renamed because one of the addictive traits that we find is that people, you know, they will listen to us and we seem like we're the odd people out and that we're the ones that are causing fitna and discussing this stuff. And then they go to these people who call themselves Salafis and they say they're following Salafia and then they give these, you know, these nice uh, phrases, Quran and Sunnah and Salaf, you know, when you say you Salafi, it is attachment to the way of the Salaf the first three generations and any person work their weight and knowing their knowledge, knowing that the first three generations is the best time period, the Salaf was solid. And that's why I put in the second point, the Salaf is a blessed time period and Salafia is a school of thought. Salaf, the Salaf is a blessed time period and Salafia is a school of thought. And so there's a difference. So there's a difference between following the Salaf and Salafia, which is Wahhabia renamed. And this is something very important to know, you know, because when you hear them people saying that they follow the Salaf and then you have to look at some of the names that they're using, some of the terms that they're you're using, some of the principles that they're doing, you know. So we have to know the difference. And I'm going to give it on the next slide to give you an indication of what it means. The Salaf and the Wahhabi movement renamed the Salafia. So Imam Zahabi has a book in his uh, collections called Siyar Alam Nubala, right? He has a quote here, he says that the Salaf are whoever lived before the year 400 and the Khalif, the Khalif means the later generations, are those who came after the year 400. So when we know our deen and, you know, we're talking to the choir here for mostly, but this is for people who may, you know, you know, go for it, you know, <laughs> click this on later and try to follow us and try to critique what we're saying. And they try to make it seem like we're attacking, 
the hawk and all that stuff they come up with. No, this is about education. So we're given a couple references, you know. So the seller for those who lived before the year 400 and the color for those who came after the year 400, right? So in following the seller, then you're following those imams and those scholars that came before the year 400. And then in that, you're following an isna, the chain of narration that can be connected all the way back to the Prophet Sallallahu and all of those imams who came before the year 400. All right, so is that that's clear so far, right? I mean, I think everybody knows this. Uh, so the next one, this is what we need to know. And many of us, we know this because we have these teachings with our, our beloved Imam Amin and others that you should know the Salaf versus the Salafia and know that Salafia is Wahhabia renamed. Somebody in the comments uh, mentioned about, you know, because this is one of the arguments you got to know how to counter when you say, uh, you know, Wahhabi, they saying that it is, it is, um, it is the greater one of Allah's names, Al Wahhab. You know, that's not what Wahhabia means. Allah is Al Wahhab. He is the bestower. You know, Wahhabia means something else. You know, it's the same way that you know Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is Al Qadir. He is the one who is capable. But no one ever says about the Qadiriya, one of the uh, deviant sects of old. No one says that that's an abuse of Allah's name when you call him the uh, uh, the the, the Qadiriya, you know. And no one says anything about the old sect of the Jabariya when Allah's one of his name is Al Jabbar. No one says when you say the Jabariya, no one says that this is a distortion of Allah's attributes. No, because this is just naming the people what they um, what they follow. So. So we should know most we know these terms because we're talking to you know our people. So before 400 is all of the imams that we follow. Imam of uh, the imams of the four uh methabs, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, and Imam Ahmed, and the four schools of fiqh, and Imam Abu Hassan Ashari, and Imam Abu Mansur Maturidi. So you see the dates, these are the dates that they died, the Hijri dates. So remember, we said. The Salaf or the Salaf for Sali are those who came before 400. And after 400, and you see on the right, these are the Imams of the Salafia movement, which is Wahhabia renamed. All right. So you see Ibn Taymiyyah died the year 728 after Hijra. Ibn Uqayyim, 751 AH. Ibn Abdul Wahhab died in 1206 AH. Ibn Baz died 1420, which is current day. That was 1999. Alabani died in 1999. Ibn Uthaymin died in the year 2000, right? Now, one thing you should remember that whenever you see people who claim Salafia, the ones on the right are always a reference point before the ones on the left. You would be hard pressed to find anybody who claims to be a Salafi or clear Salafi or academic Salafi, you know, because they said that they follow the seller, but in their movement, they got, you know, different factions too, you know, they all follow the same imams and then they got a do not take list from this. All of them went to the same school, studying the same books, but then they don't even deal with each other, you know, and you will be hard pressed to anyone who considers himself a serious Salafi and Salafi means they are follower of Salafia. Salafi means they are follower of Salafia. They would be hard pressed to find any of them except that these uh that these imams on the right are the foundation. Most notably Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Uqayyim, right? And if you study the history, Ibn Abdul Wahhab, he said that he read their books on his own. He read his books on their own and he was um he was uh like impressed by the writings of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Uqayyim. Now, you all know learning here, how do we learn knowledge? You know, you learn it through a teacher who teaches you the knowledge, make sure that you know it, and then they give you ijaz or they give you permission to teach it because they know that you know it because you reviewed it with them. And that's how the ISNA, teacher the student, teacher the student, generation after generation up to this very time. That is what we have on the left. You know, everybody that is Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah following the way of the Salaf, they follow this on the left. The one on the right, it started with Ibn Abdul Wahhab, right? He said in his biography, and you can read it, you know, as a research. I don't encourage you to read those books, 
But in his biography, he says that he read the works on his own of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Uqayyim, right? Now, if you know anything about that movement, not you know, because I used to be, you know, I used to be with the Wahhabis, right? These names were always presented. You know, they used to mention the Imams of the Salaf on the left, you know, like sparingly, like you know, pick and choose what they say, you know, to, to, to uh to uh you know make their point. But on the right, you will always find them. They might mention the Imam Abu Hanifa, you know, and then they'll take uh, some of the statements out of context, but they'll always say Ibn Taymiyyah, always say Ibn Uqayyim. You know, to them, they're Sheikh Ol Islam. Ibn Abd Wahhab, they call him the Mujaddid. Ibn Baz, they said that he was, you know, I don't know, they like the greatest scholar since sliced bread. Alabani, they said that he was the Muhaddif of the era, you know. And Ibn Uthaymin, they used to say that he was a faqih of the era. So anybody, any history, you know that before in the mid nineties, when it was, when this movement was taken off, they used to say that following the four schools of fiqh, right? They used to say that it was like the Jews who followed their, their rabbis. They used to compare that. They used to compare us to Kufar, right? And then the two schools of Akita, they just said it was Divi, you know? Uh, I remember one of them, one of the scholars, when I used to roll with them, right, they asked him a question about uh, somebody in the audience asked him a question about what about uh, Imams Nawawi and uh, Imam uh, um, uh, Ibn Hajar Asqalani? May Allah be uh, pleased with both of them. That, you know, that they were known, and as we know, that they were Ashuri scholars, right? And uh, this, this particular scholar, he said, well, you know, they're in the house. But with Akita, they came in through the back door. <laughs> he said, they he said, these great imams that even these Wahhabis know the great imams. He said that they came in the back door with Akita. The most important uh concept in Islam is learning your beliefs. He's saying that these great imams, Ibn Hajra Askalani wrote the, the, the commentary to Sahih Bukhari, the most authentic book in Hadith, right? And Ibn uh, uh, Imam Nawawi, we already know about Imam Nawawi because, you know, he's from the Shafi school, so we always reference his works, right? This man said that they came in, and this man, was, I'm talking about in 1998 uh, or something like that. He said that they came in through the back door with respect to Akita. So that's one of the triggers that they said that Ashur and Maturidi Akita, you know, which is a codified Akita, they said it's a deviant Akita. But they saying that the some of the stuff that Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Uqayyim, uh, you know, what they promote, you know, and, uh, you know, we need a whole nother class to just go through that. But we, you know, we're talking to, uh, you know, our regular people. So you already know some of the statements that they that they made and some of the blunders that they have made in Akita, which some of it is tantamount to Kufr, you know. Some of it is, you know, when scholars have called them these things, you know, or made mention of them. You know, it wasn't without, it wasn't unfounded, you know, and I'm not saying that here. I'm just saying, you know, some of this stuff that is, is blasphemy, you know, and may Allah protect us from that. So you should know these dates. And most of you know these dates, you know, you should know these dates of the scholars. So then you know who the Salaf is. And then when one of the trigger words with these people who follow this, and then the people who are addicted by hearing these names over and over and over again, you know, you think Ibn Taymiyyah, you think Ibn Uqayyim, they always mention these names. You know, there was one book, uh, I, I couldn't find it, but they was talking about the uh, the methodology of the Salaf, I forget the name of it. So what they do is they mention these Imams and then they had the dot, 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 and then they start with Ibn Taymiyyah. So you see the date Ibn Taymiyyah died and the date that uh, Imam Abu Mansur Maturidi died. That's a 400 year gap. That's a 400 year gap. And so one of the things when we talk about Isnad, which of the Wahhabis renamed the Salafis has a connection to Isnad from that time up until the time of Ibn Taymiyyah? You know, when, when they ask about that stuff, you know, they can't they can't say nothing. Then that, that's when they start you, you, you really exposing that they, they really want, as one of my teachers said, they're page turners. They're page turners. They know how to go through books and make selective things to cherry pick. But as far as having an isnad, they don't have it. 
So you all should know this uh, slide right here. Uh, you know, be familiar with these names. So when you come across these people and they try to uh, inject you with that poison and make you addicted, you know what I mean? They try to, uh, you know, they uh, uh, what they used to call it back in the day, they put a Mickey in your drink, you know? <laughs> you know, you drink it, you all crazy, you know, you don't know what happened. Then you think these people are great scholars, you know? So you know know those days so and i'm and i'm just doing this to give you all a visual you know to give you all the visual okay so now some of this we talked about the addiction so some of the symptoms that you all should know and we'll just discuss a couple of them the first one is trinitarian tawhid anytime you read those books those glossy cover books i put shiny books down there but they always talk about uh and imam naeem uh alluded to it earlier they always talk about Tawheed in three categories and that if you don't understand Tawheed in three categories, you don't correctly understand your belief in Allah. And then if you look deeper into what they're saying, they had a belief that the Jews and Christians believed in Allah too. They just worship different. You know what I'm saying? And that's not the case. They didn't believe in true Tawheed, the Rububiyah, like they proposed. So they, in, in essence, they're saying that you believe in the law and the Jews and Christians believe in the law is the same. Like there's no distinction, but the distinction when you truly believe in the law is one, you say Shahada. <laughs> when you truly believe that Allah is one, there's no other recourse except to be Muslim and other the Shahada. That is the difference maker, you know? And if you don't do that, then you, you can't believe that Allah is one because any other, any other uh, people, they don't believe Allah is one. And outside of Jews and Christians, you know, you know, you have these people, they believe in other gods and all this kind of stuff. And then a supreme being, that is that is idolatry, you know. The second thing is one of the issues that we have with them is that the mutashabihat verses are made literal. And what do I mean by that? So, you know, we always talk about the muhkamat and mutashabihat, right? And many of you know this, you know, the muhkamat are those that have one specific meaning and the mutashabihat verses are those can that can have a multitude of meanings, right? And not just one meaning, right? So this is where it's one of the symptoms when you, when we talk about these uh, attributes of Allah, when we talking about when we talk about uh, the verses that we we contest them with, you know, especially about about Allah who's subhanahu wa taala, about when we use these terms waj and ayn and um, and uh, and yet, you know. So this is the trick that they do. You know, they tell you that they say we accept the we accept the verses upon their literal meaning and how they are we leave to Allah. And that's not what we believe. We believe in the verses as they came and we don't make any interpretation. There is no how for Allah and we don't assume a literal meaning. So what they do, they saying that they, they already assume a literal meaning. So they already made a cave before they even discussed the cave. You know, <laughs> they said they assume a literal meaning. So these and the, and this is one of the things you need to ask them: Are these verses muhkamat or mutashabihat? Because I asked one of these uh, so-called students of knowledge, you know, and he said he didn't know. He said he did not know. And this is another just a quick side point. Why you should be grateful? What well, we have Imam Amin doing, and other other scholars of Ahl Sunnah, is that they are teaching us these concepts. So this brother that I asked, you know, we was having the discussion about the attributes of Allah, right? The sifat, and so when I said when we talk about waj and ayn and yad, you know, which is translated as hand, face, and that kind of stuff, right? I asked him, all right, was these verses muhkamat or mutashabihat? He said he did not know. And this man supposedly studied in, you know, overseas for a number of years, knows the language, teaching people online. He said he did not know. Now, I don't know if he was just doing that to be spiteful or, you know, trying to be funny or, you know, how they, you know, they, oh, I, I act like I don't really know just to see what you're going to say. That kind of, you know, that trickery, you know what I mean? But I really think he didn't know because if you don't, if you knew, then you should have said it, you know what I mean? So these verses that we discussed, they're mutashabihat, right? That they can carry more than one meaning, and then you don't assign the one meaning 
that they don't carry is the one that they assign, the literal meaning, you know? That's the one, that's the problem that we have with these people. And so they've been giving Allah limbs and appendages and giving him parts, you know, that this is not befitting of his majesty, you know. And so that that's one of the problems there. So they take these verses that can mean a number of things. And then some of the imams, you know, the safest way is tough weed, as we teach, is to recite the verses as they come and just leave them as they are. You know, without any explanation, without any delving into it. And then some of the imams of the caliph from Ahlul Sunnah, they had to explain them to offset that literal anthropomorphic meaning that these people were giving, right? Another symptom is you, you know, you hear us talking about this Quran and Sunnah. So you see, I put this dot, 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 dot here, right? So they say we follow Quran and Sunnah. We're upon Quran and Sunnah. And then some of them who are more clever, they say, you know, because they have all types of slogans. Quran is soon upon the faham of the of the of the salaf, upon the minhaj of the salaf. Okay, so what is the minhaj of the salaf? You know, it's Quran, right? Knowing the sunnah, you know, knowing ijma, you know, knowing kiyas, right? Now, you know, some they some of them are changing their tune now because you know they they've been exposed. But they used to say you know, that, you know, they didn't accept Kiyas as a source of law. They didn't accept Kiyas as a source of law, right? So, um, you know, some of these things now, they're changing it. You know, for those who came up in the 90s, you can go back now and a lot of stuff that they used to promote, they took it out because they've been exposed. And so this is part of the, uh, you know, Ahla Sunnah stepping up and then having more access with like online platforms and teaching Alhamdulillah. So we got to keep we got to keep it going. So another symptom of these people that makes uh, people addicted to Wahhabism is that they're preoccupying, being preoccupied with shirk, bid'ah, and blind following, right? Shirk, bid'ah, and blind following, right? Uh, so one of the one of the trigger things that they do um, is that you know they accuse the majority of Muslims of committing shirk. They accuse them uh, of majority of Muslims of committing shirk. And here, what they call shirk is uh, acceptable practices as tabarak, uh, tawasso, and istigada. You know, this is not the place here to discuss those things, but more than likely, this is what Ibn Abdul Wahhab saw, and he called this shirk, these practices. You know, we discuss these things like that, you know. And then, you know, they used to say that blind following was committing shirk with taklid, you know, so they define taklid as that you're following a scholar and you don't know where he got his proof from, right? But as a layman, you don't need to know. So right? you're following uh, uh, authority and scholarship that you trust. That's a real proper meaning of taklid. It's following an authoritative uh, uh scholarship or personal academia that you trust. So it means imitation. You know, it don't just mean blind following, like you don't know what's going on. You know, that's how they try to present it. Like people, they try to present it like people that don't know nothing and you're following them. So all of y'all just misguided. No, you're talking about imitating some of the greatest scholars that this Ummah has produced with a long line of scholarly heritage. That's what Taklid is, you know? So, uh, and I always use this example, and I used it before. You know, Taklid is like, you know, if you go on a tour of Disney World, you don't just go on a tour of Disney World by yourself. They have a tour guide, a tour guide that shows you the do's and don'ts and ups and downs. You know, would you go on a tour of Disney World and the tour guide is telling you where to go, what to do, this is what happens, this is the history. Would you tell the tour guide, um, where did you study at? <laughs> No, you would not do that. If someone is leading you on a journey, you're not going to, you know, question them about because they are there for a reason, you know. And then, of course, we have the example of what blind what blind following is in the story of Musa and Khidr and Surah Tukaf, you know. Follow me, you know. Listen to me and be quiet, you know. I know what I'm doing. You don't know what I'm doing. That's the problem, you know. <laughs> so and then he taught them the lesson, you know. So the other symptom is these shiny books. You know, I heard, I seen a couple of people uh, make fun of it in the comments. 
But yes, they have these shiny, glossy books. But if you look at the contents of the books, there's the same recycled stuff, the same name. So if, if I go back to the slide before, it's the same names. Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Ukayyim, Ibn Abdul Wahab. Uh, you know, and then currently they have Sheikh Fauzan. You know, at one time, you know, with the different um, different sects within the Wahhabi movement, uh, the Salafi movement, right? You know, they had Sheikh Fauzan as a deviant one time. <laughs> but you know that they only have so many scholars that they can take to out of the hundreds of thousands of scholars that exist, exist today, they only have about seven or eight. Do you ever hear them talk about the Mufti of Saudi Arabia anymore? Where is he? What happened to him? He's the head leader, lead scholar, lead scholar in that country. And you hear about Fauzan more than anything else, right? Why is that? You know, these are some things that if you see these symptoms from these Wahhabis, or if you are suffering these symptoms, if you're coughing, if you're sneezing, you can't sleep, you have all these things, you know, you need to go to a Sunni doctor. <laughs> yeah, shiny books. Also, the other things... It's Saudi Arabia, you know, one of the symptoms is Saudi Arabia. And I think in the back of our mind for many people, when we are still impacted by this uh, addiction to Wahhabia, we look at Saudi Arabia as the standard of, you know, the Islamic world. And, and I would say that Ibn Abdul Wahhab, he knew this when he seized the Holy Lands, that he knew that whoever was in charge of the Holy Lands would be seen as the leader of the Muslim Ummah. And so this is why his whole fight was about conquering Saudi Arabia or well, the, uh, the Hijaz, right? So if you look at um, the Saudi state, you know it was in three stages. So here I wanna give you a reference book, right? That you can read. It's called The History of Saudi Arabia. The History of Saudi Arabia. Right, and it's by uh, uh, Madawi Al Rashid. So he discusses in the book the three stages of Saudi Arabia. So the first stage is when Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab took it upon himself to, you know, delude himself into thinking he was purifying the land from shirk. Now another thing that you should remember is that all of the idols were destroyed during the time of the Prophet Salam. When he had Imam Ali, he had him destroy all of the idols in the Kaaba. And that was in what year? You know, the, the 10th year of the Hijra, 9th year, 10th year of the Hijra, right? So Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, as we showed on the last slide, who started his mission in 1157 AH or somewhere around there. So that was the first Saudi state. And if you know any histories of, of those things, he waited till his father died to come out in the open. He waited till his father passed and he started propagating his dawah. And what, and you read in his biography and those gl shiny, glossy biographies, he's saying that the people were steeped in polytheistic practices and that he had to purify the land. And so what did he do? He got with Muhammad Ibn Saud. You know, you don't, if you, if you follow them closely, they don't talk a lot about Muhammad Ibn Saud. And that should make you a light go off. Why? Why don't they talk about him? Because he was like he was like the muscle, you know. He was one of those people, you know, during the history of the Arabs, they had these clans that they would protect their turf and they would, you know, support these caravans and all these kind of things. And then they would also take from other people, you know, because they were in a land that was kind of barren, you know what I mean? So they were like, you know, what's equivalent to gang leaders, you know, you know, <laughs> moving, moving work. You know what I'm saying? Having a whole gang. That's what he was. He was the muscle for Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, right? And so they made a pact. I think uh, one of his sons, Muhammad ibn Saud, married Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab's daughter. And from that, you have the Ahlul, the Alu Sheikh family. This is the ruling family in Saudi Arabia. And anybody that's considered a scholar comes from this bloodline. So they made it about blood instead of about scholarship, you know? So the first uh, Saudi state was from the time up in, uh, when Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab uh, started this mission, and then it ended. It lasted for about 75 years. And then that's when the Ottoman Empire came in, 
and said, whoa, it's time to finish these boys off, you know? So you should look up the history of Muhammad Pasha and it's, uh, it's uh, Ibrahim Pasha and Ali Pasha, I think the name. So they were the, the saviors, you know, for the Ottoman Empire because they came in and they routed all of those Wahhabis out because they were already established, right? Then they, after, you know, they were removed, they were almost wiped away clean, right? The second one was from in the year 1240 AH. Uh, and then that lasted for a while. And then the Ottoman Empire came again because, you know, they started, you know, they started getting their numbers up together. They started seizing lands, taking control of lands. And then they were routed again. And this time, some of the grandsons and uh, of Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab, they were put in jail in Egypt. One of them was beheaded. Right. And so if you make the connection they, when they got to Egypt, was was the late 1800s. They connected with uh, Jamal Adina Al Afghani and Muhammad Abdul. That that whole movement. So they got some of these uh, reform ideas from them, right? So some of them ended up coming back. And then the third Saudi state, which was uh, Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud, started in 1902. So by this time, you know they had British support and all this kind of stuff. And then they discovered oil, right? In the early part of the 20th century and then that third saudi state was established in 1932 right and then you can read about how this, all of this stuff came together and um you know and then they sided with the british and the, the americans as support and if you look at the history of muhammad ibn abdul wahab and all of his sons and grandsons and all of those leaders all of their wars was against muslims all of their wars were against Muslims. You know, you don't have to take my word for it. You can go back and check it yourself. So Saudi Arabia, how it got established, right? Uh, it was by this delusion that the Muslims was committing shirk when shirk was removed thousand years prior before Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab even came about. And he used it. So he used the same narrative that the white folks use to say that the Native Americans were savages and that Africans were heathens and as a justification <laughs> to take their land and kidnap them and kill them all under false pretenses, the same narrative. The Africans were heathens, the Native Americans were savages, and according to Ibn Abdul Wahhab, the Muslims were committing shirk, the same narrative. So if you believe that the Muslims were committing shirk during his time, then you might as well believe the Native Americans were savages and the white men came to save them. And the same for so-called heathens in Africa. The same concept. All right. And then the other thing, the symptom, and this is one of the big ones, because people hear people like us, you know, and we're not, you know, at least I'm not, you know, skilled. I don't have a lot of knowledge or anything. But I know what I know. You know what I'm saying? So people will hear these people come from Medina University. Now, just a trivia question. What year was your... Uh, Medina University established. Everybody except the genius. I know the genius know. <laughs> if anybody want to take a guess at it. 1960, 1961. So a question is, why is Medina University considered by a lot of people the standard? When we had great Islamic institution that's been around for thousands of years, Al-Azhar in uh, Morocco, they had institutions in Syria and in, uh, in Jordan, everywhere. Why is Medina University considered the standard? And this is one of the things you have to look for. So people are graduating from Medina University they're saying they follow the Quran and Sunnah. They know some Arabic. They know some terms from the Salaf. They know some names. They know some dates. And we get distracted by the shiny books and they dress in all white thobes and the, and the red and white tablecloths and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, they sound like, you know, they know something. And, um, you know, uh, and we go for it. So we had to look for these symptoms. So, and it's really, and Medina University is a Wahhabi fortress. It's a Wahhabi fortress, you know, and nowadays it's so much that people, when they're ready to study knowledge, they think they should go to Medina University. 
They think they, that's the standard. You know, if you tell people to go to Al Azhar and go to Al Yemen, if they are affected by this Wahhabi addiction, they think that that's the most pr place to get the most sound knowledge. And it's really the opposite, you know. So um, that's something that we should pay attention to. Trent, when you hear these symptoms, when you see these symptoms, people talking about three categories of Tawheed, and they make these uh, mutashabi have verses literal. They talk about Quran and Sunnah, follow Quran and Sunnah. Imam Amin already expounded on that. They don't even know Quran and Sunnah to say that they follow Quran and Sunnah. Shirk bid'ah, blind following, uh, you know, these kind of things. Shiny books, Saudi Arabia, do some research on the history of how that Saudi state was established and Medina University. Look at some of you know the other universities and institutions in Islam that produce scholars, you know. And I, I remember one brother was telling me uh, because we see people graduate from Medina University and they're a great student and they're a doctor of this and they have this faculty and you know they got their PhD. I remember a brother told me that he was in, in Al Azhar and he said one of these guys came as a, uh, to Al Azhar and he was in Medina about 12 years. And he said they put him in a fifth grade class. <laughs> they put him in a fifth on the level was a fifth grade teaching because he didn't know nothing all those years. And then, you know, to us, when we hear those people from Medina University, oh, they said in the, the master of the Prophet Islam and this kind of stuff. And that to us, that sounds great, you know. But when you compare it to actual knowledge, that's why they never want to have a discussion. That's why they never want to have a discussion with people who know because they're going to get exposed, you know? And the last one, I'm sorry I took up so much time, but just the last slide. Yeah. Yeah, we got the uh, 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 resident historian on on deck, Akil Fahad. And we wait for him to, you know, use one of your sick days, man, and come on the show, man. You know, stop chasing the bag all the time, bro. All right, so the remedies that I, uh, as I conclude. That's like that, what Imam Fahim said. Use one of your sick days, actually. Yeah, man, I know you got them stored up, man. You got 401k, you got bread. Man, come on and take, well, you know, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, so this is some of the, the thing. They said that Ibn Abdul, Ibn Wahhab got rid of shirk in Saudi and people should learn more about him. Now that's what we teaching. That wasn't shirk, <laughs> yeah. but see, I, I'm not. Go, I've been like deliberately ignoring the comments because I don't got time. I want to get through my presentation. So some of the remedies is the first one: know some history, know about those three Saudi states, know about Ibn Abdul Wahhab learning stuff on his own, because they say that uh, Ibn Taymiyyah wrote over 600 books. Ibn Uqayyim wrote over 60 books. They say. So if Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab said out of his own mouth in his biography, he studied their works on his own. Like nobody read those books with him to make sure he understood them. He read them on his own and he was infatuated with them and he used them as a means to take what they were teaching even further to where he was killing Muslims who said la ilaha illallah because he misunderstood tawassal istigada and tabato. He considered it shirk and other the, other the, some of the other con concepts that he has. So it wasn't no shirk there. So you need to know some of that history. How was it established? He did it on his own. And then Abdul Aziz ibn Saud, who established the last third part of the Saudi state, he did it with the help of the Kufar against Muslims. Because when they talk about the Ottoman Empire, these people, polytheists, and these trigger words that they use, these were people that said, la ilaha illallah. <laughs> how did he know that all of these people committed shirk? Because if a person is known to be Muslim, and even if he does something that seems like an act of shirk or an act of kufr, you have to confirm from them. I mean, some of the things would be cleared, but a Muslim already knows it's by necessity. A Muslim already knows you don't flush a Quran down the toilet or you don't step on it. That's kufr right out, right? But if a Muslim does something, you know that they're a Muslim, you know they say, la ilaha illallah, and you see them do an act of shirk, you have to confirm from that person individually where their mindset is. Did something happen? Were they out of their, right, out of their mind state? before you can make a ruling on him. He killed people in mass, in mass. These are all, you know, he said that they were people of, uh, you know, they were polytheists. These were people Muslims. It's the same concept when America says the Vietnam War. 
The Vietnamese don't call it the Vietnam War. They call it the American War. <laughs> you know? So know some history. The second thing, know what you know and know that you know it. I think one of the issues when we find ourselves, some of us, in this Wahhabi addiction and still having the default state sometimes is that we're not confident to know what we know and know that we know it. So, you know, what we, uh, and, and I, and I always give a shout to both of my emails for, you know, going day, day to day and teaching and teaching and instructing to make sure people know what they are supposed to know. So, you know, that, you know, and have some confidence that you know it when you come across these people, don't be impressed. Don't be especially by ones who speak Arabic and they went overseas to study. They just know the wrong belief in a different language. <laughs> you know, they just know the wrong belief in a different language, you know? So, and we should, you know, be know that what you know and know that you know and have some confidence. The other point as a remedy, be able to articulate what you know. What you learn, just teach it. If you got to start with your children or your grandchildren or your neighbors, whoever, Know what, be articulate in what you know and be able to teach it so you can keep going back. So, because we need more people to uh, expand and teach the ways of Allah Sunnah, the treat, teach the tradition of Islam. The other one is press them to explain. Press them Wahhabis to explain because when you go talk to them, because some of us, we still mix with them. We try to, you know, and we want everything to be nice and we just want all the Muslims to be united. So we go with them and then they tell us something else. And then from what you're learning from a traditional source, ask them to explain. And that's what you all you have to do, man. And when they talk about, oh, no, nah, this is that, you know, following the meth habs, it's shirk, it's blind following, explain. Ashari Akita, Divin Akita, explain. You know, these scholars, such and such, so and so, this, that, and the other, they believe, explain it. And they'll be hard pressed to do it. Right? The other two is don't be fooled, impressed, or amazed by anyone. And this is just something, a stigma that we have as black folks. Whoever, you know, gives the most fiery speech and the most impressive talk, we just gravitate towards them. You know, Imam Amin said this morning, it's not entertainment. It's not entertainment. You know, we get on here and we talk about stuff and we joke and laugh and we take shots or whatever, you know, the stuff we do. But it's really about taking care of our people who've been duped and been bamboozled and many of us haven't even been exposed to traditional Sunni learning and we have some of our people saying you know for a long time the stuff that they're knowing that's basic and traditional Sunni Islam that they never knew and they never been exposed to you know and that 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 makes you want to cry sometimes so don't be fooled impressed or amazed by anyone because of where they study and who they are and you know, they got nice looking, you know, they look good online and they got the angles and the lighting and the books and behind them, you know, and that wasn't a, a jab at you, Imam Naeem, you know, I'm, you know what I'm talking about in general, you know. <laughs> and then the other thing, principles over personalities, principles over personalities, know your principles. So when you hear every personality comes along, because one of the things in that Wahhabi movement is that they cling to personalities and then these people don't know their principles. You as Ahlul Sunnah have to know your principles. You know what I'm saying? Because when you engage these people, they don't know anything. All they know is this, this shirk and bid'ah. And, you know, they give them these trigger words. You know, Ashari is deviant. And it's like almost somebody put a chip in their head and that's all they know. Then you ask them, what is the farthest Sunnah in the Salat? What are the obligations of the Salat? They can't tell you this stuff. So you've been with the student and knowledge all this time and they're teaching you and you don't know what's farthest Sunnah in your Salat? You know, so those kind of things. All right, so that kind of um, ends my um, presentation. I'm sorry I took too long, Imam. Uh, I do apologize, but this is sometimes, you know, my, you know, because where we at, we're bombarded with Wahhabi thought, man. But books, you can't, you know. I went into the Islamic place, not the Islamic place, Tuba Fashions uh, a few weeks ago, and I'm like, you know, I just you and go and get my Bukhor, you know. And so I was like, let me go look at this um, book section. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, man, not one. And then one of the things that they take our books and they distort them. Like if you look up Akita Atahawi, right, Every you'll see every Wahhabi distortion, it says they have a specific commentary on it. Like they won't just say you to buy the text. They say you have to uh, you have to read it with this commentary. 
you know. So, but uh, it's it's very dear to me because me being bamboozled for a minute in that movement, but alhamdulillah, I was able to have teachers who came before that and they saw the movement coming a while a, a mile away, and then I had teachers who took the time to teach me and show me a different way. And plus, I was never no, you know, I was never no kind of flunky. I always been my own man. So, you know, like I, I've said before on this platform, you know. I, I recognize in, inward stuff now with my eyes closed. So when I see the actions of it, I'm like, okay, it's not adding up. You know what I mean? So because we come from an era where your your word supposed to match your match your deeds. And if they didn't, then you know you became suspect. And so I brought I brought that over to the dean, and most people have since did. But a lot of us we we forgot about our experience in Jahiliya, you know what I mean, or before we became Muslim. And act like we negated that whole thing. And somebody told us we couldn't be who we were supposed to be. We lost our intellect. We lost our, you know, uh, our ability to think and stuff like that. And we let people take that away from us and with religion, you know. And so sometimes this becomes, uh, you know, personal to me. And I'm always concerned. Now, I used to be like confrontational, just ready to attack Wahhabis, you know. And in my area, they still attack me by name, you know, when I'm like, no, it's another route. We got to look 20 years down the line and make sure we are teaching people to offset because they are already imploding. You know, as we mentioned it earlier, they are already imploding because they read the same books. They so-called follow the same scholars, but you'll find them at each other's necks. But they blame the people who follow the traditional Islam, the four Sunni schools and the two schools of Akita. I've never met anybody, you know, there's, you know, tits and tats everywhere, but I never met anybody that are at, at each other next, like Wahhabis, you know? And then you have some of the more moderate ones who are trying to shy away from the teachings of Ibn Abdul Wahhab, but still Ibn Taymiyyah is the head of it. And that's a whole nother topic, but I want our, our esteemed Imam to come, you know, finish this off. So excuse me for taking so much time, Imam, um, you know. How about a few tech peers for that presentation? <laughs> <laughs> Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. I got about seven reference books around here, man, but I tried to make it simple. So I was like, I hey, go for it, Habibi. MashaAllah, no, Barakallah, yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, I really don't have much to say. You guys did a great job. What do you think? They did a great job, right? MashaAllah. I told y'all, y'all didn't need me. I got it, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um Bismillah Rahman Rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen was salatu was salamu ala Rasulillah. All I would have to say on top of what y'all said that we gotta stop entertaining ourselves because this ain't funny. We have fun, but while we're having fun, we need to learn. Too many of us have fun and they hear the truth, but they don't learn the truth. They have fun. They hear the truth, but they don't learn the truth. So my thing would be, all right, we have a little fun. We enjoy ourselves. Did you learn? Can you articulate what was conveyed? Can you be a source of taking away this addiction from our communities? And from people, or are you just one who was eating popcorn, enjoying the movies, eating ice cream, drinking pop, and not learning anything? And with your pom poms, just yelling, Yes, yes, that's right. Get Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab and Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Al Qayyum and Al Bani and Bin Baz and Fauzan and Mukbil and Rabi Al Madkhali and blah, 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 and you ain't learned nothing. <laughs> Don't be like that. For me, this is only valuable when you learn and then you implement. Other than that, we're just entertaining ourselves. And to be honest, I'm sick and tired of entertainment. I need some real learning where we actually make a change. That's where I'm at with it. We, we educate and we do it, 
But if we ain't learning, we just entertain ourselves and we go back to our lives, go back to our default Wahhabi position and every other ruling except talking about names, I'm, I'm not impressed. <laughs> Seriously. Right? But when we learn, when we are truly Ahli Sunnah, Asharis, Maturidis, and we know Al Aqaid al Ashariya wal Maturidiya, we know the beliefs of the Ashaira and the Maturidiya of Ahli Sunnati wal Jama'a, and we know the difference between that and the difference in the beliefs of the people of innovation, whether they're Wahhabi or Shia or Qadariya or NOI or more science temple, whatever it may be, whatever kufr or bid'ah that's outside of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah and the true Islam. When we understand that, then we've done something. When we are Maliki or Hanafi or Shafi or Hanbali, and we actually know the rules of the religion and all al abwab al fiqhiya and all of the different chapters of fiqh, and we know the shurut and the arkan and the mubtilat. We know the conditions and the integrals and the invalidators. We're not doing invalid prayers. Partly I'm Shafi'i outside, we're happy inside. What's the rules according to the Shafi'i? I don't know, I'm just Shafi'i, but I pray like a Wahhabi, right? I'm Maliki, but my Aqidah is al Aqidah the Wahhabiyah. Where are we going? We're not going to change. So I'm just saying for us, with all that we're learning, sounds great. We got to implement it. We got to actually do what we're learning. It can't just be rap. And each and every one of us play a role in that. Okay, you learn. Now you learn. Go convey what you learn. Make sure you know it well. Because those who have you, they're ready for you. And if you come half cocked, they're going to tear you out the frame. You can say all you want in your cheerleading section. When you step on that field and you ain't ready, they're going to do you like the Washington did Philadelphia Eagles yesterday. <laughs> E-A-G-L-E-S, Eagles. <laughs> Got to have some fun. Right? You may sound all great. You step on that field and you ain't ready. They're going to give you the business. So all I'm saying is make sure you learn well. Right? Make sure you understand globally and historically. Make sure you know your books. Make sure you know your scholars. Make sure you know your assignee, your chains of narration. And if you don't know all that, you need to sit yourself down with a teacher who knows that shut your mouth and learn that's my refutation of the wahhabis if you can do that you'll be able to refute them it's easy it's not hard their their religion is nonsense but if you don't know your religion you think their religion has some substance and when i say their religion it is as if they came with a whole new religion that Islam has never, ever known. But when you don't know Islam, you don't know that. You actually think they're upon the Sunnah. You actually think they're following the Salaf. Because you don't know the religion yourself. You don't know what you don't know about Islam. So I want us to get past that part. Right? And what we do every single day is try to get you past that part. Right? So for me, that's because we're going to continue to teach and we're going to continue to spread. But if you don't learn, it doesn't help us much. And then once you learn, you got to implement. And until you implement, no matter how much you know, it's not going to be effective. It's just a bunch of knowledge you got in your chest. But until you can articulate it and implement it and spread it and then help on the battlefield of da'wah, on the battlefield of explaining the creed of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, on the battlefield of learning the rules of the religion, it's all talk. And honestly, we are in too deep of a situation to keep talking. We got to talk, yes. But more importantly than talk, we got to implement what we're talking. And 
That's my rod ala al wahhabiyya <laughs> Go ahead. Alhamdulillah. And I'm glad you made that point because you saved me a lot of time. Allahu <laughs> Akbar. Because Imam Fahim, may Allah protect and preserve him, he talked about symptoms of Wahhabi. I'm talking about, I want to talk about some symptoms as well, but not from that perspective. I want to talk about symptoms of relapsing addicts. Because we're talking in the context of addiction. We can also more rightfully so talk about this in the context of disease. And many people consider addiction to be a disease. Wahhabism is one of the cancers that the Ummah has. So it's like it's a disease, right? So this particular disease, many of us are in various stages of recovery. And, and, and really for a lot of us, we recognize that, hey, man, listen, this thing is bad. You know, this thing ain't right. But we don't know how to move forward. And I want to mention a hadith, a part of a hadith anyway, a famous hadith uh, uh, narrated by who they fit been on the Yaman. You know, he talked about uh, uh, some of the signs of the last day. He talked about becoming uh, uh, divided. And he talked about, he asked how the Prophet Sallallahu what you should do when the fitna comes. But I just want to mention the first thing that he said, because I think it's relevant for uh, what we're talking about. He said, uh, he said, يَقُولُ كَانَ النَّاسُ يَسْأَلُونَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ عَنِ الْخَيْرِ He said, the people used to ask the messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and grant him peace about good. وَكُنْتُ أَسْأَلُهُ عَنِ الْشَرِ Makafata and Yutri Kani. He said, but I used to ask him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about the bad things or the evil out of fear that I may fall into it. And I think this is relevant for what we're talking about. Because see, Imam Amin, for example, on one hand, he talked about how he needs us to learn what proper belief is or what Ahlu Sunnah is. And a lot of times we're not doing that. But where our environment is so toxic, most of us, we don't even know what a Wahhabi is. Some of us think a Wahhabi is a dress code, meaning short pants, all black, or sisters got to wear dark colors, or sisters got to uh, cover their face, right? Some of us think that's Wahhabism, even though, uh, even, you know, like many of the Wahhabis, they've lightened up on that, but. Most of us, we associate Wahhabism with either some type of dress code or we associate Wahhabism with bad character, being harsh or being separate from all of the Muslims, right? Or many of the other things that they're known for. And we think, you know, that's what a Wahhabi is. No, a Wahhabi is someone who has a completely different belief than the rest of the Muslims. And as Imam Amin said, you won't know that if you don't study the proper belief. Because many times the same terminology is being used. So you don't know. You think it's all just word semantics. They say that Ahl Sunnah work Jama'at. Y'all say Ahl Sunnah work Jama'at. So in your mind, it's the same. Why is it the same to you? Because you have not learned properly. And whenever you have not learned properly, you have to humble yourself and go back to the basics. And too many of us don't want to do that. I always tell the story that like when I was incarcerated, right? When I was when I was up north, I had this uh non-Muslim that I used to kick it with, right? And one time he got, you know, when he got the mail, right? So he got his mail. Hey yo name. Yo, check this out, man. Yo, read what my girl told me, right? So he was like, you know, all animated and stuff. So I read it. I didn't see nothing that would cause him to be like all animated. It was just like, you know, Normal stuff. I miss you. Can't wait till you come home. Blah blah blah. Right. So I'm like, oh, that was strange. Why you say, why you say you'll read this? Right. So this happened like two, one or two more times. Right. 
And after about the second time, I realized this guy, he don't know how to read. And he want me to read his letter to him. Because the second time he was like, oh, yo, check out what she just said, man. Yo, yo, yo now I ain't read this. So I, I read it. I'm like, what is he talking about? Like, what is he seeing? Getting them all excited. So I think it was the third time. This happened three, maybe four times. Anyway, the third time, I, I tested him. I didn't give him no feedback. I read it. I was like, yeah. Oh, yeah, mm. right. <laughs> so what you think? Uh, I, I see where you're coming from, man. Right. <laughs> no feedback. And then after about maybe three minutes or so, him trying to get a response out of me and me being real tight lipped, he said, I can't read. Can you read it to me? I said, man, why you just say that, man? <laughs> I said, man, like, I ain't going to laugh at you or nothing like that, man. I said, it's not a problem. Not knowing how to read. We know how this education system is. They just push you through whatever. The problem is staying illiterate and not learning how to read. Like, bro, we in jail. We locked up, man. You get education for free, right? And so and uh, a lot of us as Muslims, we're in the same boat. Because of this toxic environment that we're in and because we're the target, right, we haven't learned basic Islam properly. The basic belief and following the school and to so off, all that stuff is Mason mentioned in the basic elementary school, elementary books of every legitimate Islamic school of thought. And the people, the, the little kids that are students, they memorize these books if they're you know being groomed to be students, right? But some of us, we've embraced Islam, and because we've been targeted for disbelief, having a, a form of Islam that's not really Islam, right? And we've been Muslim 5, 10, 20, sometimes 50, 60 years. It's unimaginable for us to have to go back to the beginning and learn some basic book like the Ashmawiya or the or the uh or the Akhdari, like speaking like from Maliki Fiqh, or the equivalent books in other school. We ain't trying to do that. And that's a problem because it makes us right. For Wahhabism. So we don't even know what a Wahhabi is. We don't know what a Wahhabi is. We think the belief system is the same. Two different distinct belief systems. We don't understand it. So many and many of us, so, so that's one example. We don't know what a Wahhabi is. And even if we explain it, some of us still won't understand what it is. Why? Because as Imam Amin said, we don't even understand our own belief. So we don't understand what we're supposed to believe, and we so we can't compare it to nothing. We can't compare the belief of Ahl Sunnah wal Jamaat to the belief of the Wahhabis. So we don't have no foundation, and we don't want to learn in an organized structure. We want to learn on you know just videos like this on YouTube. We don't want to go to you know class number one with the teacher and go and go through it slowly and be able to ask questions. We don't want to do that. We say we want to do it with our mouths, but we don't do it because we're stuck in our ways or we have a million excuses. Oh, I got to go to work or I got, you know, I'm just too busy. You're too busy to get your belief right. You know, you're not too busy for that. Another symptom. So, so that's one system. We don't need well, one symptom of relapsing at it. We don't, we don't even know what a Wahhabi is. And because we don't know what a Wahhabi is, this is another symptom, and it's, it's kind of connected with that, that if those of us who don't identify with the Wahhabi or the self-described Salafi movement, among them, because they kick each other off the menhag, that's what they call it. They're really ostracizing each other, right? but they call it kicking off the menhaj. So when some of them kick another one of them off the menhaj, we're confused because we don't know what a Wahhabi is. So when one of them gets kicked off the menhaj, we'll say, oh, he's Ahlu Sunnah now because he got kicked off the menhaj. 
you know, so many times this has happened. Bruh, sis, they're still a hobby. They still have the same belief. Go ahead. Go ahead, man. I'm going to just get a little personal. For all of you, Umar Suleiman, Yasser Qadi lovers, yes, they are affected with that Wahhabi stuff. Just so you know. But he sounds so great. I know, I know, I know. Just to, I hate to get personal, but I just, because what you just said, so many of us, they be here, yes, 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 and online, Wahhabi. Did you see what Yasser Cardi said? Boom! I'm just so just for the record, he's a Wahhabi. He's a Wahhabi. Yes. I know he sounds good. He's very educated. University of Medina graduate. Look at the chart. And he went to Yale, Mr. Charlie School. He got it all together. He's a Wahhabi. Don't be fooled. When you learn Wahhabi stuff, he's Wahhabi. And everybody you see around him is Wahhabi sympathizers. All right, I'm done. I'm done. So that goes back to what the imam mentioned earlier, right? Uh, we don't know what we're supposed to believe, so we don't know what Wahhabi beliefs are. So we think, which moved into my next symptom, that if someone gets ostracized or as they say, get kicked off the minhaj, we think they're no longer Wahhabi. No, their belief hasn't changed. Just the other ones stop messing with it. Right. That's what the reality is. But us outsiders looking in, we think, Oh, he's not Wahhabi anymore. No, it's still Wahhabi. Right. So that's another one. Uh, another symptom is we haven't most, uh, most of us, who don't claim to be Salafi, what, what they call themselves, or what they are, Wahhabis. We don't claim it, but we don't follow a methab either. We don't follow a school of, of thought, a, a school of fiqh. We're not Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, or Hanbali. We're not, most of us. And some of us, we, we fence riders, right? We say that, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I ain't no Wahhabi no more. But uh, I haven't picked the meth app yet. I'm still trying to figure it out. Ten years later, right? What meth have you followed now? Well, I'm still trying to figure it out, right? <laughs> You're doing the Wahhabi stuff. And this doesn't go to say, right, that because now they switched it up because as Imam Fahim alluded to, you know, back in the 90s, couldn't follow no meth app. But you got to watch these jokers because now a whole bunch of Wahhabis follow meth apps now. Right, so you think, oh, this brother, he ain't no Wahhabi, he Maliki. Now that Negro ain't no Maliki, that dude's a Wahhabi. <laughs> so you got to watch, right? But many of them, a lot of them, most of them still don't follow a method. And some of us who are recovering Wahhabis or recovering default Wahhabis, right, we, we, we have that symptom. We ain't following no method. We've been sitting under email. I mean, how many years you've been teaching online? Almost three years. It's been more than two. For me? Yeah. Um, the Ramadan before COVID. Some of y'all have been sitting with email. I mean, since then, and you don't have no meth app, and you still ain't Shafi yet. What you waiting for? Yeah, that's a good point. You a Maliki Wahhabi. What is the problem here? Why don't you just come over here, Shafi, death row, where we don't have no Wahhabi problems? No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Wahhabi's all up in your meth hab. <laughs> the, the amazing thing about that, it used to be the opposite historically. It was the one method that they ain't get to. Now, subhanAllah, that was ying, this is yang. <laughs> subhanAllah. So, so a lot of us, and that goes again back to what Imam Amin was mentioning. A lot of us are just being entertained. We still were hobby in our opinion with regards to method, because we ain't following no method at all. And so that's another symptom of 
uh, relapse and what have you. Another symptom is we have problems with basic Sunni terminology. We have problems with the term Ashari. We got problems with the term Tasawwuf, or let's call it Teskia, right? <laughs> oh, what's wrong with it said? No, what's wrong with Tasawwuf? No, because some people might, man, listen. <laughs> See, if you look at people who have like real drug addictions and they finally kick the drug addiction, you see that they're very hostile to anything that will lead them back to their addiction. You find somebody that really been years not drinking or years not drugging or whatever, they see you coming a mile away. Anything that's going to bring them back closer to getting high, they're against it. They ain't on the fence trying to please everybody like a lot of us relapsing uh, uh, ex Wahhabis or still sometimes dibble dabble Wahhabis are. Right? You got a problem with the term to sow because the Wahhabis got a problem with the term to sow. You still identify with the Wahhabis. That's your problem. You don't like the term using the word term Wahhabis because the Wahhabis don't like to use the, being called Wahhabis. That's why you have a problem with the term Wahhabis. Wahhabi. You still identify with them. In the same way like Michael was talking about the house Negro, still, ide still identifying with the masses. Boss, we sick. <laughs> we are, many of us still identify with Wahhabis. Because we still Wahhabis at heart. Even though we know it's wrong, but we just addicted. We just stuck. We just, just trying to kick, man. We just, they just be calling me. Just be calling me. <laughs> I try to kick. I try. They just be calling me, man. The shiny books. The shiny books. Just be calling me, man. Another symptom is it refuse or drags their feet in relearning from the basics. And I mentioned this earlier. Listen, once you realize that you, we, you've been taught all wrong, you got to be honest, man. You got to, okay, let, I'm a baby in this thing. Let me start from the basic book, right? Most of us ain't doing it. Why? Because we think we know something. And the thing we think we know is really Wahhabism, most of it. Another symptom is, and this goes for imams, some imams that claim to be Ahl Sunnah. That so called Ahl Sunnah imam, you may go to his masjid on Juma and see a Wahhabi giving the khutbah. If that so called Sunni imam really believes that Wahhabism is deviance, is major innovation in creed, if, if not outright kufr in creed, how would he trust a Wahhabi to give a khutbah at his masjid? What kind of shepherd are you? Each and every one of you is a shepherd and will be questioned for his flock. The imam is a shepherd and will be questioned about his flock. Are you a shepherd or are you a wolf in sheep's clothing? You serving up your congregation to the wolf, to the deviants. A shepherd's job is to protect the flock, not serve them up to the wolf. Or you come, I have them all lined up for you on Friday, one o'clock. Right, come over, come over here, speak your stuff, kick your stuff. A Sunni, a so called Ahlu Sunni imam that does that, he's a Wahhabi. Or if he's not a Wahhabi, he's a Wahhabi pimp. Go ahead. But you know what is. Even more amazing that they will give the platform to the Wahhabi person, but will not let a Sunni get on the member. That's neat. He's a Wahhabi pimp. Like in a movie, Malcolm. Are you Elijah's pimp? Get him out of here. So they they're Wahhabis in Ahlu Sunnah clothing. God, you about to say something, man, Fahim? No, no, I think it's a couple questions uh, that are floating around. Right. Okay, I, I, I got one more thing and, and one, two more points and then I'll finish. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the last symptom that I want to mention, and a lot of us got this, we still listen to Wahhabi speakers. 
So he ain't talking about Aikida in this talk, right? If you really recognize the, the, the danger of that disease and the harm that it caused, you wouldn't be going nowhere around it. Or oh, I'm I'm just going in the crack house to eat a burger. My man's and them be up in there. So I'm just being what they call it, the tra trap house now, they call it, right? And I'm just be hanging in the trap, man. I ain't getting high. I'm just up in here with everybody else. Who does that? Right? Who who hangs out while people's getting high and they ain't getting high? Unless you benefit in some kind of way of it. So a lot of us, we want to get so close to it. Oh, I know he's a little hobby, but I listen, he he's speaking to what I what I want to talk about, right? Many people in our family do the same thing. They be posting Wahhabi speakers. How you Ahlul Sunnah Wal Jamaat and posting a Wahhabi speaker? You doing their da'wah for them? You calling people to you calling people to them? You so called Ahlul Sunnah three four five three Shehu family advertising Wahhabi speakers? I didn't know he was a Wahhabi speaker. You didn't tell me he was a Wahhabi. That's the point. We shouldn't have to tell you. You're supposed to learn the creed properly so you can know the difference between the two. We shouldn't have to tell you the name. And the last point that I wanted to make is not necessarily a symptom, but it's Iman Fahim. I know you probably saw. You saw that movie Rebound? Not the one with Martin Lawrence, the other one. With Don Cheadle. Rebound? Yeah, Rebound. No, I didn't There's at least it. two movies named Rebound. One of them is about I don't watch movies. <laughs> <laughs> One of them is about a famous uh ball player from Harlem, Earl the they used to call him the GOAT, Man of Goat. I they made a movie about, about him. I know what you're talking about, but I didn't see it. They made a movie about him. I think it was a HBO movie or something like that, right? And basically, you know, he came up during the time of Kareem Abdul Jabbar, right? And so you know he was he was a, he, he was nice on the court, he was known. For being able to jump real high, this dude will like literally jump from the ground, and they used to put money on the top of the uh, uh, the backboard, and he would jump and grab the money off the backboard. Right? He was nice. Remind me when I used to ball, Dad, my <laughs> man. And nobody make no documentary about you nowhere. <laughs> Was it remind me how I used to do Camden in the finals? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the reason why I mentioned him is because he got strung out on heroin, and he made, and he he eventually recovered, but he got bad. Like he was shooting dope in his in his legs and everything, messed up messed up everything. So he began coaching. He tried to revolve uh, revive the rocket tournaments and stuff like that. And but I mentioned that just. If you've seen that movie, just to give you a visual on what Wahhabism is doing to our potential, this dude was supposed to be like, you know, he was supposed to go off, you know, battle Lou Al Cinder, you know, Kareem Abdul Jabbar before he changed his name, right? He's supposed to battle him, but you know, so he was up there with all them greats during that time, right? But his drug habit, you know, messed him up, he never reached his potential because of, because of that, because of that drug, because of that addiction, right? And we're watching this happen with us right now. We are not reaching our potential because of this Wahhabi addiction. It's so bad that we can't even learn basic books because we're addicted to Wahhabism, basic Ahlus on the books. And so we have to kick this thing cold turkey and stop relaxing, stop relapsing, stop, you know, playing around and, and, and you know, uh, you know, getting close to addiction, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Now we need to kick this thing, man. We need to get over it, get over it. And, you know, th this stuff is serious and, and it's not a game. And too many of us got popcorn. We waiting for each other to start throwing names and attacking each other and, and all of that. And it, ain't, it is not about that. It's about it's about, you know, arriving on a day of judgment with a proper sound belief system. But we addicted to stuff that's corrupting and poisoning. it. And so I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't. We can go to the questions. Oh, you ain't you ain't do the questions, huh? You know, I mean? Now we gotta go searching for questions. No, I saw a few. I didn't. Um, I didn't really get to right, them. Let me let me just move up. Yeah, but um, yeah, you know, some of the things um, there. Uh, I saw... Ask them. <coughs> um, could you play repost any questions you may had because they get lost and we'll be all day looking for them. 
So if you didn't post a question and you had a question within the last 20 minutes, we didn't, we're not going to be able to find it. So if you had a question that wasn't answered, please put them back up and we'll start uh, with some of these questions and I'll start here. Great. You might find then I'll answer that question. It says, I was going to ask about him, Omar Suleiman. I hear him speak on spirituality and about angels. I list for cues. I guess that's supposed to be C U E S. Uh, Sister Mariam, you're a 3453 affiliate. That's embarrassing. Um, that's that's the Brooklyn way to spell cues. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, how they say, uh, uh, dead ass. <laughs> uh, I listen for cues, but don't hear specific identifiers. What's being taught there that I am not getting? Sincerely asking, I prefer to be spoken to than at even one of even one on one if possible. I need to understand one person doing all I'm doing, missing something, help a sister out. Okay, go ahead, ma'am. I'll let you. Uh... So, uh, I would say this. And that's for everyone. So I won't talk to her in private. I'll talk to her and I'll have her answered privately in more detail. Let's just say in general, Imam Fahim did a beautiful job. I think tonight we can agree he did the best presentation. Sorry, Imam Genius, he got you. Man came out with his shiny uh, PDF and slides, <laughs> his PowerPoint, and all the you know, names of the famous scholars, the big five, <laughs> he was ready. You know, Shiny Peter, PowerPoint. I, I, I said that boy bad. <laughs> <laughs> so with that being said, if you go look at those points he made, there are certain key identifiers of Wahhabi doctrine in creed, in practice, in fiqh, right? And if you just go to the old saying that we all learned growing up, birds of a feather flock together. You hang around dogs, you're going to get fleas. So, I mean, them, those wisdoms of the old heads are very true. So if I'm with you, we got something in common. Trust me, right? That's from one side. Now, if you go down that list and then you keenly listen, but you have to learn because these are polished deceivers, polished. They're educated. They're polished at what they do. They're not like us. They're not brothers from the hood who just raw and kick it out there. This is what it is. Nah, 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 nah. We're politically correct and savvy. That's why we get the big bucks. That's why all those Hanafi uncles give us so much money because we nice with ours. Man, come on, that was that was nice, huh? You ain't get that one. It was nice. Come well, on, Imam Genius. That that was nice. It was nice. I caught it. Right. We polished. Right. So I would say start listening after knowing the creed of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah and then listen for the points of divergence. And then you'll know yourself. Yeah. You are a Wahhabi, even though you don't call yourself one. You have Wahhabi ideas. What is your creed? Tell me. What's your creed? Go look at his issues on creed. Go look at his issues on these. Even though they try to avoid it, they always slide it in. Are you perceptive enough to catch it? Right? Everyone, I listen to people, Sunnis, who studied. I watched them. They'll listen to Yasser Qadi, and they say he's not a Wahhabi or a Salafi. Like, what the heck are you listening to, bro? Didn't you study? Really? I mean, like, seriously, didn't you study? I ain't talking about the regular person. I'm talking about learning people. He said, if that is Salafi, I'm not Salafi. 
I don't agree with Muhammad Abdul Wahab and that he considered all Muslims disbelievers and all Muslims mushriks, but I have the same creed as him. I just don't call you a Kafir. I just don't say you, that's politics. You got the same belief. ISIS got the same belief. They just take it to another level. It's the same belief. It's the same creed. So the guy says, I don't, I consider you a mushrik, but I'm not going to kill you. And then ISIS go to another level. I consider you a mushrik and I'm going to kill you. It's the same belief. Then you got another level. I'm not going to say you mushrik. I say it's innovation. It's all the same stuff. Just what degree you want to take it to. So the polished Wahhabi, who is smart, he's going to say I'm Athari. Yatni Wahhabi, right? MashaAllah. And then guess what? I'm going to find some pseudo Sunnis, some shaky Sunnis, and I'm going to stand next to them on the stage. How can I be a Wahhabi? I'm with this great Sunni man because he's a Wahhabi sympathizer. That's why you with him, if you follow. That's a general thing. So all you have to do is learn the Sunni creed. If you hang around us, you will know the Sunni creed. We don't pull no punches when it comes to that. We ain't doing no tap dancing, no compromising, no Rodney King stuff. We ain't doing none of that. So our doctrine that we learn is a pure Sunni doctrine mentioned in the Sunni classical relied upon books. So for us, all we got to do is learn that. That's when I started. Uh, excuse me today. I'm not, I'm like, I'm, my energy is low, right? So please, I know this ain't the normal imam I mean you were looking for, but I'm trying to still give you something, right? But if we learn properly, that's why we study books. That's why we mention scholars. That's why we book, 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 right? All you got to do is study well what you got in your notes. Really study it. And then when you listen, listen with that in mind, you're going to discover it. Like, because it wouldn't be ambiguous. Are you Ashari? No. Are you Maturidi? No. You're not Ali Sunnah. So what's going on here? Why are you not Ashari and Maturidi or Maturidi? You got some differences. What are those differences? Once you discover them, there's your Wahhabism. Call it whatever you want. Call it Athari, call it Salafi, call it Wahhabi, call it Quran and Sunnah, call it Ali Sunnah, call it whatever you want. How the Muslim world has traditionally dealt, called that after the time of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, they called it Al Aqidatul Wahhabiyya, the Wahhabi Creed. Call it whatever you want. At the end of the day, whatever you just called that, we as Ali Sunnah know that as the Wahhabi Creed. That's so, so. I don't, I'm hope that's clear, right? Go ahead, next question. And and for the personal, for our sister, we'll, we'll give you more information, like just personally. Yeah, we're going to spread love the Brooklyn way, Sister Mariam, you know, inshallah. Um, yeah, we got another question. Uh, where's down? Oh. I posted a couple of them in the... Uh, Okay, let me just, could you get whatever comes up now and just put them in a the thing? Yeah. Like whatever you, we didn't answer, just put them in a the thing and I'll repost them. Okay. Yeah, I posted a couple. Um, yeah, I, I put it up. I'm putting it up now. Okay. Uh, where did it go? And uh, yeah, to the other question though, just quickly as you post that one, you know, you when you listen to these other people, you should kind of, know what to look for and that's why i put in that presentation just some trigger words you know because some of these people are um and i know in my own struggle that they're not ready to give up those wahhabi beliefs and they're not they're ready to accept that they've been duped you know and this is you know i don't know if it's a problem with yasser Kali because he you know he's, you know but he still hold on to those beliefs even like he openly said okay i disown the methodology of muhammad ibn abdul wahhab but Ibn Taymiyyah is still a foundation for him. The foundation of the Khalif is still that 
because this, if, even if he don't make that connection, Muhammad Ibn, Ibn Abdul Wahab still connects to uh, Ibn Taymiyyah. And all of them have him as the forefather. All of them have him as the forefather, even if they have difference, you know, and they got different sects. You know, they talking about like the Salafia equal is, is the same as Islam, you know, but if they throw you out of Salafia, what that mean? You no longer Muslim too? They all have their different categories. And you know, like some of them in the comments, they're like, they're the Medkhalis, you know, you know. And Imam Fahim, and here, can I switch that real quick? Yeah, go I'm ahead. Because this is on YouTube, people don't see this stuff, right? This person, I don't know who he is. I'm just going to, it ain't personal. So our brother, don't take it personal. We're just talking about facts, right? D -d 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 don't take take this. <laughs> so, no, seriously. If you think Yasser Cardi is Salafi, then you really don't know what Salafi is. Wow. Okay, good. Let's take that. Okay. Would we be safe to say, this is questions you should ask yourself and you're not here to defend so i'm just going to put out some questions would you say that there is some foundational beliefs that Salafi should hold there are certain things and even if he rejected two of them you would say he's not a Salafi if he hold eight of them so it's 10, for instance, just for instance, there's 10 Salafi principles. Al-Qawaidu Salafiyya fil Aqeedah, if you want to be fancy in Arabic, right? You got some Salafi principles in Aqeedah. And there are 10, for instance, I'm not being verbatim, you have more. If he stands on the wrong foot, he's not Salafi, according to some of you. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about some basic principles. If he rejects two of them, he's not Salafi to y'all. But for us as Sunnis, if he takes one of them, he's a Salafi. Do y'all got the point here? I'm going to repeat that so everyone can hear us. For the so-called Salafis, if there are 10 points, you can make them three. I don't care what you make them. And he rejects two of them. To you, he's no longer a Salafi. For us, as Ali Sunni, Ali Sunna, Al Ashaira, Wal Maturidiya, if he holds one of them, he's a Salafi. Is that clear? I want to know for everybody, did you understand what I just said? For you, you may discount him, throw him off the minhaj if he renounces one or two principles. For us, it's the opposite. If he accepts one of those principles, he's a Wahhabi to us. Now you understand? So it's not a difference. Right? So do you follow my point? For you, if he rejects one principle, he's not Salafi. For us, if he accepts one of those Salafi principles that contradicts Ali Sunnati Wal Jama'ah, he's a Salafi even if he rejects the other nine that you say. For us, that one, as an example, if he, for instance, accepts all of your beliefs, accepts he doesn't consider the people who make tawassal and tabarak as mushrikun, right? He doesn't accept that. To you, he's not Salafi. For us, if he believes that Allah is in heaven above his throne or above the throne that's above heaven or in the heaven or however y'all want to make y'all beliefs whenever y'all decide what it is, all of that is rejected to Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. Whether you say above the heaven, on the throne, in the heavens, moving between the heavens, whatever crazy creed that y'all Salafi Wahhabi people got, all of that is rejected by Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. Nahnu Ahl Sunnah. Our belief, Allah mawjudun bila makan, wala jiha. That's the belief of Sunnis. Anything other than that is the belief of people of kufr, bid'ah, and the Wahhabiyah are among those. In some positions, their belief reach kufr. In some things, it's just bid'ah. All of it is outside of the belief of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. I think I'm clear now, right? So there's no ambiguity, ambiguity no matter what you say. 
I'm telling you the position of Ashadis. You can tell me the position of the Salafis, fine. And y'all can fight that out among yourselves. To us, none of that stuff is accepted. I think I was clear on that, right? Very clear. Shiny. Shiny like a Wahhabi book. <laughs> Okay, we can take the next question. I just, I just had to deal. I don't, I didn't want to leave that out there. Like we running from it. We don't duck wreck, so we ain't running. Meet us in the yard, cuz. <laughs> okay, we had that question by Abdul Kareem. How come the ones of us who know what happened to us in Islam? had the most difficult times accepting that we've been lied to and never really know Islam pro properly as a whole, accept it or even say anything about it publicly or privately. Why are they so afraid? Is it just cognitive dissonance? Um, you know, I, I put in the uh, PowerPoint, it just like, you know, this, uh, these signs of psychological addiction, you know, that they have, you know, that we don't want to address certain things because we are afraid, you know, and a lot of us coming out of that, you know, and then it, if you extend it, many of us came through movements and then, you know, Wahhabi, Wahhabism was the last stop. And so, and it sounded probably more authentic than the other ones, you know, because they were quoting Quran, they were quoting Hadith, they was, um, you know, they studied in so-called, you know, so-called universities and stuff like that. So it sounded good. And now we're having a turnaround, a reawakening of traditional Sunni Islam being taught. So a lot of people, they just don't know, you know, and this is why it's important to know what you need to know, you know, and then know that some of the stuff that you've been hearing all of these years is, is, is a um, just a small part you know, a small distorted part of what Islam is and just been magnified because of the support that it had. You know, we're up against, you know, petrol dollars. You know, we're up against petrol dollars that people can mass produce millions of books and spread them around the world and, you know, and recycle the same old concepts, you know, and distort stuff and, you know, delete passages, you know, and then if somebody from al come come be like, this is what the original text says, we're the ones that's looking like we causing trouble. <laughs> Y'all be they took stuff out. <laughs> they just yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry, great, great, great. No, go ahead. Yeah, I'm good. Y'all don't warm me up. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Here's what I'm saying. Because you know, the brother told myself I could talk. You can talk. Go on your platform and do your business. You can talk. You can talk. No one's blocking you from talking. Just what we did, you can go do it. And then spray, spray say your stuff. And when you say your stuff, you, it'll be heard. Don't worry, everybody that spoke before you. I don't think you got nothing new to say. Trust me, there's a million Wahhabis on TV speaking on, on Facebook and YouTube saying the same stuff. There's a bunch, in our communities, there's a hundred shiny books to say the same thing you're going to say, right? So You're already, you already talking out of context. Right, <laughs> I don't think you're going to be blocked, right? And here's what I say to you right with us what i'm saying is not about me right i'm not saying about me the same argument you would say about me or imam naim or imam you're going to say that about imam al nawawi you're going to say that about imam al qurtubi you're going to say that about imam al tabari you're going to say that about al hafid ibn hajar al asqalani and every other great scholar al imam al bayhaqi you're going to say the same thing about all of them and this is where I said a new religion. The real thing is when they finish, there is no people and guided on the earth except them. Not even the most illustrious scholars in this ummah. All of them are deviants. But we're going to take what we want from them, but they are deviants. That's reality. So whatever you say about me, you're going to say the same thing about Imam Anawi, if you're honest. Because Imam Anawi believed that Allah exists without a place. Imam Al Hafid ibn Hajj al Asqalani believed Allah exists without a place. Imam Al Qurtubi believed Allah exists without a place. Imam Al Tabari believed Allah exists without a place. Imam Al Bayhaqi believed Allah exists without a place. 
So the same argument that you're using against us common people, you're going to use against the scholars. So what we're left with, if we are be honest, see, we're honest about it. Y'all got a double edge when it comes to that. Just say it. All the great scholars of Islam were deviant, and we can deal with that. Now, we can even accept or reject, but just be honest. Don't say something that, then if they're all scholars and that was their belief, then our belief is correct. Or they were scholars with bad belief. Which one? You should answer the question. Their books are available, so we don't have to, like, we don't have to uh, debate that. Their books are available. And if you're a good Arabic reader, and even if you're better than us, because we, we you know we ignorant black folks, you know we don't know too much, but you do, so we could just follow you and you show we got the books, so we can just match the books. This is not hard. We can actually bring the books, you can read the statements, you can translate us, and then tell us what we're missing. Because we read the books, we have the books, our libraries are extensive, you know, so it ain't like we don't know. So my point is, if we're mistaken, it's not our mistake. It's the mistake of a whole group of Muslim scholars from the time of the Salaf to our time today. That's not a, that's what we receive. Just like most of us received that default Wahhabi nonsense y'all been giving us. We didn't know no better. That's what Saudi Arabia pumped into the cities of America. That's what they did. That's when they took a bunch of brothers and took them to Medina, put the battery in their back, charged them up, sent them back to our community, spread the stuff. We received. So just like we received that, we also learned al Sunnah, and then we compared them, and we saw the difference. That's it. It's not a fight. It's facts, not a fight. So if we're misunderstanding something, make your videos, read the books, do what you got to do. Explain so we don't be misguided. We're not stopping you from doing that. Go ahead. Just like y'all ain't stopping us from doing what we're doing. So we're doing it. So it's not a, you're not a, no one got you, man. Put your money where your mouth is and do your work. And we will examine your work. That's it. That's all we're doing. And you can examine what we're saying. And that's what we want you to do. All we're doing is pointing out things that were hidden from our people by those guys who gave you that false doctrine you carrying. That's all we're doing. And guess what? Just because we black, so it's the black imam's round table. Let me add something to that. Just like the white man did our people, and then some of our people came and said, hey, Mr. Charlie is doing us a bad number. We're doing the same thing. Hey, that Saudi guy, that Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab guy, and his buddies, they doing us a number. We're doing the same thing, no different. So as black people, we understand that. And all we're saying, hey, black people, this same thing is coming from another route. That's all. Barakallahu Bikum, may Allah guide us and you. <laughs> I mean, and Sister Marion, let me find out that this, I mean. book, this book of characters related to you, the one on YouTube. Let me find out that this is in your bloodline. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. This guy called me pretty. Hold up. I just got to have a little fun. He said petty. Oh, petty. I'm sorry. I looked at no, pretty. No, no. Boy, you, boy, you, you. You know, I was getting ready to hit him. Yeah, no, nah, he said pass. petty. I thought that was pretty. Give him a, give him a pass, man. I'll give you a pass. I was getting ready to hit you back. Go ahead. <laughs> Get a little ninja a drink, man. <laughs> oh, ooh, look at this one. No scholars are infallible, including the Wahhabi ones. <laughs> Especially if it take me Right. No scholars are infallible, including the Wahhabi ones. All right, I'm done with him. I just got to have fun. I can't help it. That's the only way I'm going to stay engaged. Okay. Uh, we got uh, one says, is the Athari creed valid? And why are so many Salafis Athari instead of Ashari and Maturidi? Say it again. There's a question that says, is, is Athari Creed valid and why are so many Salafis Athari instead of Ashari and Mat or Maturidi? Go ahead, Imam Naeem, take that. 
I leave it to y'all to give the more technical answers, right? right. I, I'm going to I'm going to answer it the way I see it. A lot of us, and I say us, I'm just black folks. A lot of us were Wahhabis or self-described Salafis or default Wahhabis, right? And I I defined what that was in the comments earlier, uh, and so. I think it's a case of cognitive dissonance. Like we we recognize something is wrong. But there's an emotional attachment to it. So we don't want to be Ahlul Sunnah, even though we're calling ourselves Ahlul Sunnah. But we know this Wahhabi thing ain't right. And so, right, I think this is their way of holding on to uh, Wahhabism, the Wahhabi creed, under the guise of being authority, right? What they will tell you is that being authority and creed means they hold the same belief or Akita of Imam Ahmed ibn Hamad. But as they say, the devil's in the details because most of those people who make that claim, their belief is the same as the Wahhabi. So now I'll leave it for Imam Amin to, uh, or Imam Fahim to give a little bit more technical answer. But that's the way I see it. Like, you know, you know, I'm not Wahhabi anymore. I'm a little bit more educated. I follow a method in fiqh, and I want to claim to follow a method in, in Akita too. And my method ain't Ashari or Maturidi. It's Athar. <laughs> Uh, real quick, because uh, I know you meant my mean and expounding is definitely better. You know, I think um, sometimes they they try to hide out with saying after the creed so they could just say we just take from the text. And if they're truly fo following the after the creed, then they would just do what Ashuris have already been doing. <laughs> and just, you know, with those ambiguous texts, they would bring take them as they came and just leave them and not try not to explain them. Cause you know, uh, that's where they be. That's where the most problems are with these people with this Wahhabi belief. You know, when we talk about Istawa and Yad and Ain and and uh, Sak and all of these things, when they give these literal interpretations and then their delusion, they're thinking that they're just accepting the Athar as they come, but they're already assuming the literal meaning of these of these attributes and just saying we just don't know how they are, and they don't understand that they're saying okay. Yeah, we believe that Allah has a hand. We just don't know how it is, but it's nothing. And then follow up with Laysa Kamitli Hishe. You can't do that. You know, uh, I think one of the uh, one of the scholars, I think it was uh, uh, a Bagawi, that he said uh, about Istawa, he said, Ista, the meaning of Istawa al al Arsh is Istawa al al Arsh. <laughs> like that's the Ashari way, and that should be the Athari way, but no. What do they do? They tell you these things mean sitting. We just don't know how. It means location. We just don't know how. And then it goes into other distortions, as somebody posted, where Alabani said that Allah exists in a non-existent place. Yeah, so. You muted, Imam I mean. Hey, I don't mind having a little fun. We have to close. Yeah. Is it okay if I let Sheikh Ona Hujatul Islam Sahibul Dalil Al Qatia Abdul Hakim Booker have his say? I would love to hear him express himself. I know what those keys do, but I would love to hear him. Is he up for it? I don't know. If he wants only him, hold on one second. Yeah, give him the link, man. I would love to hear him. Abdul Hakim on YouTube. Where you at, little buddy? That's for you. Grab the link only for you. Come in as Abdul Hakim Booker, who you are. You're welcome. I want to hear you. Well, as I'm going to ask you, if you felt as I'm making fun of you, I'm going to give you a chance to say what you understand. All I ask you to do is don't get belligerent because I'll have to click you off. But if you're trying to really express a point, let's hear it. I'll take you on. 
sign up. Let's go. You say you want to talk. Go ahead. There is only for you. Don't go get your buddy. Don't go get your teacher. You. Because if you can't talk, then you should be quiet and tell your teacher to speak for you. And it ain't a debate. We want to discuss. I want to hear your points. So to be fair, because you you throwing missiles. So this, go ahead. You said you want to talk. Island was silent. Come on, let's talk. I'm going to teach you a lesson tonight. Out of love. Out of love. I'm going to teach you a lesson. Come on, let's go. As in our joking way, what's that in Harlem Nights? What she say? Bring your hands. <laughs> 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 hey, fine. What was, the, what, was that, what was Eddie Murphy's name? Slick? Quick. Quick. Oh, you want to shoot my Bring <laughs> your <laughs> While we're waiting on that, uh, our brother Farouk, he asked me uh, uh, if he, uh, Sheikh Abdullah Hakim quick influenced me. He was a heavy influence on me on my early days in Islam. Okay. He ain't no, coming no, 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 no. You asked for He's still typing? Yeah, he's still talking. Bring it. I'm going to teach you a lesson. I'm going to learn you, son. Right <laughs> Now I'm just messing with you. Now Abdul, honestly, Kareem, Abdul yeah. Kareem said I get 50 on my next check if he comes in. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cut you off. I'm going to, as I'm gonna say, you say, right? And we're gonna clarify the issue because you said you want to talk. Okay, Island was silent. Talk. I'll I'll pay power for if he comes on. <laughs> because I'm telling you. I'm going to teach you a lesson so you stop and you just be a brother. Don't shoot missiles. I ain't running. I do this for a living. I'm not running. You got me all confused. I'm not nobody. I know I stand on the backs of giants. Like Imam al nawawi like Al-Hafiz ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, like Imam al-Qurtubi, like Imam al-Bayhaqi, like Imam al-Tabari, like Ibn Kathir, like all those people you quote, I live in their books. So, Alam Asalim, come on. You're welcome. That's what I thought. All right, let's 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 move on. Man, I can't believe it. Yeah, Abdul ha Hakeem oh. Booker, Chucky Booker, Mary Booker, they just all together. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, no, that's a look. Nah, I'm just messing so, with you. So we're done. That's it. We finished. So now, listen, we ain't running. Because listen, it ain't personal. I believe the game been played on all of us. And so even if you know something that we don't know, okay, let's discuss it. We've been had. We got that point. So I'm not surprised that you're going to come. I doubt if anything you're going to say, I haven't heard a million times, right? But I guarantee you what I'm going to show you, you never heard. I'm guaranteeing you that. I'm sure 1,000% that what I would show you, you've never heard. But you know how I go. So go ahead, move on. And guess what, y'all? That's how easy it is to deal with Wahhabis. Go ahead. He's now still typing. On. It don't matter. He's finished. He, he, <laughs> it's like he's in the he's in the in the stands, like the Eagles fans throwing at the Washington after you got your butt kicked. No, <laughs> he like he like Ben Vereen to play Will Smith dad at Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Yeah, tell him I had to go. You know what I mean? He come out. We wait. <laughs> is he coming? <laughs> Why don't he love me, man? <laughs> but 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 honestly, brother Abdul Hakim, with all due respect, we having fun. You hang around, you'll know we good brothers, right? It ain't personal. Ain't nobody mad at you, right? All I was gonna do is give you a couple speed lumps and then tell you I'm sorry, right? It wasn't gonna be hard. Trust me, I wasn't gonna really beat you up. I already know you really don't know what you're talking about. You just got a battery in your back. That's what you heard on the men bar. You ain't did no real study. I already know those things. I can listen to what you type in. I know where you at. So it ain't it ain't personal. We're just having fun as brothers. It's just 
that's us. We black, man. We yeah, do this we, stuff. We saw you coming from a virtual mile away. <laughs> yeah. It ain't personal. We love you. After the end of the day, you know how many Wahhabi friends we know that we got to smack around every day? It ain't, it ain't, it ain't nothing new. Bro. Some of our best friends were Wahhabis. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> my neighbors are Wahhabi. My next door neighbors are Wahhabi. The guy around the corner is a Wahhabi. The guy at the store is a Wahhabi. The guy at the gas station is a Wahhabi. The mechanics are Wahhabi. We used to it. No, the, the, the Wahhabis are Wahhabi. <laughs> We're just having fun because we do realize what we're dealing with. Our people need a little bit of fun. I'm woke now. Okay, so are we taking any more questions? Are we going to conclude or what we? Oh, wait a minute. He said, I wanted to have the discussion, but you're very playful. All right, I promise you, I won't play. I won't crack one joke. <laughs> no joking. Yeah, it's too late now, man. I'm just messing with him. Go ahead. And I'll try not to laugh if you come right, over. I, I, I keep a serious face. All right, go ahead. Now let's let's move on. I'm just having fun with the breath. I love him. Uh, are we taking more questions? Are we finishing out? Or how are we doing? Let's the uh... questions because I wasted time. I apologize for wasting your time with having fun with my brother Abdul Hakim. I thought he was going to come on and we could have a real serious discussion, but. Um, um, but he ain't ready for that. And I got it. And I wouldn't, if if you really don't know, I wouldn't embarrass myself either. I would just stay in the back. And you're welcome to come see me. You're welcome. I'm, I'm at Master Muhammad. I don't hide. You could come in. And I'll treat you nice, seriously. You won't be, you won't be abused. You won't be, you'll be treated like a brother. Trust me. So you're welcome. Alan Wasalim, go ahead. You, you will be handed your hat and shown the door though at the end. All right, <laughs> you know, we're going to do it tonight. Oh, so this one says, for the imams, have any of you been told growing up or in growing in Islam that Allah is everywhere, or have you heard it over years amongst our people? That's clear, uncut proof that we've been default Wahhabis from the gate. Um, the, I, I used to hear this, but I never understood it as Allah, like literally being everywhere. You know, I always heard that Allah's knowledge is everywhere. And that was explained. You know what I mean? And it wasn't really until um, I heard some of these intricate beliefs of Wahhabis until I listened to other than Wahhabis, because I'm convinced now in retrospect that a lot of them don't, they are not even aware of these things that their imams uh, believe. You know, if you show them proofs, because they always ask about what's the Dalil, right? You know, so if you show them where one of their scholars said that Allah has two real eyes. We just don't know how they are. That Allah is literally sitting on the throne. We just don't know how he's sitting. Or that Allah has organs and he has all of these things. He has a waist and he's running and he moves from place to place. You know, a lot of them, uh, they don't believe that, but they think they can just can hide behind, you know, that we accept these ayahs as they come. But the thing is, they don't come like that. They don't come like that with a literal understanding. That's not how the seller understood it. So, yeah, some of those things, I don't think they really knew, you know, but because they take personalities over principles and claim that they take principles, you know, it's more important than who said it than what's said, you know. And uh, so, you know, and then, I, you know, I really started learning this stuff in detail. And a lot of them, they, you know, they don't really know, man, you know. So that was my answer. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. Oh, this guy is cracking me up. I'm yeah, sorry. he said he studied 10 years in Missouri. That ain't what that say. <laughs> yes, that don't want that say. That's what it looked like, but that's not what that says. Okay. He's practicing, bro. Let him do his thing. Okay, yeah. I guess he maybe he's uh you know, he could have you could have told him he can come on. No, no, he's speaking, speaking Arabic Ebonics. I got it. We yeah. do the same thing in English. Yeah. I'm just you know, I was gonna say he, he could that scholarly. Yeah, he could have you could have told him that he didn't need to turn his camera on when he came on. Maybe that's what it was. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, but he just told me. In his his dialect, he said, I studied 10 years in Egypt in his Arabic dialect. He didn't study grammar, though. <laughs> but he studied Arabic. But I'm just having fun. 
All right, we so are we? All of us can mess up Arabic. We all we practice it. So don't worry, you're not impressing us. Go ahead and write it in English. You, may Allah guide you. I studied 10 years in Egypt. Allah guide you. We got it. We're not impressed. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, you, you guys answering that question about you ever heard about Allah is everywhere? Uh, or you um, want to? Yeah, it was just a belief that we didn't learn Ahl Sunnah. So we believe that if Allah is not in a place, I mean, when I say we, as many of our people, not we as us, people in our communities, they didn't have any belief about Allah. They didn't learn it. So they just assumed from apparent verses in the Quran, like, They didn't study that in Arabic. They learned he's with you wherever you are. So to them, that means everywhere, right? They didn't understand that in the books of Tafsir, that is, He's with you wherever you meet. They didn't understand that. No one taught them that. So they thought it meant, by his knowledge, they didn't know it meant that. They thought it meant, be that to he that he's physic he's with his self physically with you. They misunderstood. They no one taught them. And then when someone came, they saw no, we're the people of the Salaf. Allah Fauka Arshihi. He's above his throne. In a manner that befits his majesty. So they believed, okay, that's the real Quran and Sunnah, that Allah is in above the throne. He's in the heavens. And they thought that really meant literally that Allah is in a place. They never learned the belief of Ahl Sunnah, Allah mawjudun bila makan, that Allah exists without a place. So it's a matter of education. Both are not the belief of Islam. That Allah is in a location, no matter where that location is, above the throne, in the heavens, hovering above the throne, not touching, whatever you got. That's not Islamic belief, nor is that Allah is everywhere in every place. The belief of Muslims, the belief of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'a is that Allah exists without a place. So it's just a matter of teaching. That's it. It's just a matter of teaching. Oh, can I answer this one? That's a good question. Or do you got a question before this, Imam Fine? This is a good question. This is a beautiful question. Yeah, we get to take this one. Um, okay. Al Albani conceded in a conversation with Al Ahbash that Allah exists without time and space, while also claiming Allah exists above the throne. His framing on the second question was if someone asks, What is above the earth? Uh, what is above the earth? And then the heavens, then above the angels holding the arch, then the arch, one must answer Allah, thoughts. So let's go back to the premise of Al Albani. Average person is not going to notice. This is advanced stuff. So don't expect the average Wahhabi or Salafi to even understand what you're talking about. Most of them don't even know that Al Albani agreed that Allah exists without a place. And he never thought. He doesn't believe like Sunnis, so don't be fooled. When he said Allah exists without a place, he didn't mean to negate that Allah is in a place. Sunnis negate. When they say Allah exists without a place, they mean that Allah exists without a place. And the arsh is not a place. Above the arsh is not a place for Allah. None of those are places. Places are not attributed to Allah. That's Ahl Sunnah. The Asha'id on Maturidi. However, Alabani was slick. He, when he said Allah exists without a place and Allah is above the throne, because he said above the throne, there is a non existent place, which makes no sense whatsoever. This is a non existent place. So, yes, Allah exists without a place, but that doesn't negate that he's above the throne, because above the throne is a non existing place. Okay, yeah, Albani, you came with something we've never heard. So, so that's what he means. And his non-existing place is an intellectual impossibility. <laughs> I 
But that's Al Albani. Mustahil. Huh? Mustahil. Yes. So that's insane stuff that makes no sense for the person with a sound intellect. There's a non existent place. And that's where Allah is. So he exists without a place in that non existing place. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. I think we got two so, more questions. And now you heard what I said? They came with a new religion? <laughs> what the heck is that? That's bit our supreme. <laughs> All right, what was Rashida's question? She had a question. We didn't catch it. She's on us. She's on YouTube. Yeah, Sister Rashida, don't go back and forth with that, brother. He just want attention. He yeah, had the opportunity to come on. He yeah, ain't, we ain't give him on. all the attention he want. You don't got to give him no more. She said her question. Okay. Do you don't all take the people in the comments? They're not saying it. You had your chance. We'll wait you... till you come see me and we'll talk personally. So stop. Do you all try to talk to some of these influential scholars that are teaching Wahhabi doctrine? Of course, I've done it multiple times. Not scholars. Because right, let's be real, scholars talk to scholars. Laymen don't talk to scholars. Scholars talk to scholars. Our Sunni scholars are always talking about Wahhabi scholars. Because let me explain something to you. There is more written on this subject in Arabic than in English, historically and globally. Our scholars are always addressing these issues. The problem for us is most of us don't understand Arabic. So therefore, the discussions are all in Arabic and we don't know Arabic. So therefore, we don't know the discussion is even happening. The majority of Muslims in the world reject this stuff. They wrote books, they publish, they teach, they did videos, they did. If you went in YouTube in Arabic and you understood Ali Sunnati Wal Jama'ah, there is thousands of videos and discussions and scholarly papers and symposiums and lectures and gatherings to refute this stuff. But we don't know Arabic, nor do we know scholars, nor do we know. Let me give you an example. Among scholars that I personally met, who are the foremost scholars in their countries, they had this, I met Sheikh Abdul Razak al Halabi in Syria. I met Al Habib Salim bin Abdullah al Shatari, who was the one of the biggest scholars of Hadramaut, they got the same belief, right? I met Habib Zain bin Ibrahim bin Sumay in Al Madina Munara, Munawara, who was an older scholar, had the same belief. I seen scholars in Egypt. Sheikh Ali Juma was the Mufti of Egypt, got the same belief. I met scholars in Pakistan with the same belief. Scholars in Morocco with the same beliefs. This is the belief of Sunnis. We just don't know because we don't know Arabic. So we have no evidence. And that is not our fault. It is the job of the scholars to start conveying this stuff to us in a language we understand. And we're lacking in that. It's getting better, but we're lacking in that. And we must say we're lacking. Sunnis are lacking. Let me tell you something. Imam Zaid Shaker, all of us know him. He has the exact same belief as me. As Imam Naeem and Imam Fahim. If you if we take everything away, say Imam Zaid, tell us the creed of Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. And watch what he say. Watch what he say. Since we got Big Hamza Yusuf, and then put him up as a black imam and a learned person, our elder, ask him, no, just explain your belief to us. And watch he say the same thing we said. He might not say it the way we say it, but the belief is gonna be the exact same. If he just, what did you learn from your teachers? Tell us, it's gonna be the same thing. He might not, he doesn't speak like us. We young boys, we young, we ain't college graduates. We ex-cons, right? <laughs> we got a whole different approach. But the meaning, the words, is the same exact thing. If you understand my point. Okay, we got one more question. Um, Did we get Sister Rashida? 
Yeah, that's the one you're talking about speaking to influential uh, people of Wahhabi doctrine. That was her question. But, but, but well, let me ask, answer this part about that. What they did is just not made available to us. And our job as people who are in the middle, we got to be the bridge to get that information to us, which is we do every day, right? We do it every day. We are just really conveying what has already happened, right? We we just conveying. So when people think like we clout chasing or something, we already know we're not scholars. If you listen to us, we'll tell you all the time. We're common people. We got to follow the mutuids. We got to follow the scholars. We got to follow the reliable books. We already know that. We're not trying to make a name for ourselves. We're trying to make sure our people don't get duped no more. So it ain't about us. All we're going to do is refer you to the scholars and to what the books say. That's all we're doing. And just because we haven't been exposed, it looked like we came up with something that's different. It's right there. All we got to do is show you. Right? That's it. That's all we're doing. Nothing more, nothing less. In a way that you would understand. We're being on the ground with you. Just telling you what the, the academic refused to tell you. You know, they know it. They studied it. It just ain't politically correct to tell you. And we saying, nah, we telling them. Because we was them. We understand what that looks like. Now nah, I'm, I'm telling. Listen, they ain't telling us this. Here it go. <laughs> right? That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. Go ahead. Okay, we got one more question. Um, this is from our brother, Akil Fahad. It says, what's the path to get our, our people to accept that meth habs are required when improvisational default Wahhabism? You got your dictionary, Imam Naeem? Wait, no, I got to see this. Where's the question? Where's the question? Oh, oh, it's oh, in, oh. The, in the private chat. Improvisational oh, default Wah Wahhabism. That's Akil Fahad? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Improvisational default Wahhabism. Shooting from the hip. That's what yeah, I'm saying. Where the heck is that at? Look in the private chat, Imam. Oh, there you go. So what's the path to get our people to accept that meth habs are required when the improvisational, improvisational default Wahhabism under the guise of Quran and Sunnah is so enticing? You know what it takes? Man, it I ain't takes a, talk, man. Come on, man. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm happy to look up. It takes people to take off from their jobs and use some of their uh, you know, sick uh personal days and come and teach. You know, because they know that's what it takes. <laughs> I will add to that answer, right? You know, hey, you talking about you, I kill five. You know, they they sick, they take some of their sick days and come give us this history. But from from my perspective, and this is just my opinion, I believe most of the learned people uh, from Ahlu Sunnati Wal Jamaa, uh, when they do write or translate or teach. It's for the quote unquote upper class. We got a, we got class classism issues among our people. Like the Ahlu Sunnah, Ahlu Sunnah from our community, to put it blunt, they're real bougie. They're real bougie. They say leave that, leave, 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 leave the, the little uh, grassroots niggers, leave, let them have the Wahhabis. That's their stuff. We too good Christian for this stuff, right? So and, you know when when Ahlu Sunnah teach, you know. They use words or phrases like improv, improv, <laughs> improvisation, improv. I can't even speak. I get a super rocketory <laughs> moment. Improv is in the man, little, get your little, living color on, on, man. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> the improvisational ability of the capability. <laughs> it's a conspiracy. A C O N conspiracy. conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> no, for real, but. You know the Ahlu Sunnah teachers that 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 you know have what it takes and and could reach our community. They don't talk it out. You know the uh, the the semi literate, the barely literate, or whatever. And so even when they write books or teach classes, the people at the grassroots level can't even understand it in English. Much 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 less. Uh, Arabic or anything like this, and so the only ones talking to our people on the grassroots level are the Wahhabis. Yeah, can I have some fun for pause for our station? Okay, Zaid was a Zaid is a Sufi, so was Ibn Taymiyyah, so was Ibn Al Qayyim. What you got to say about that? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> All right, go ahead. Let's move on. So, is a uh, Zuki. so is Ibn Taymiyyah. So is Ibn Qayyim. What you got to say about that? Go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I think the path to reaching our people is a lot of us need to stop being bougie and re realize we're all a people. We, we are a people. The elite and more refined of us in the base crafts, you know, uh, barely literate of us. We're all one people. You just can't just, you know, cut the part off that you don't like and deal with the part that you like that's good for your sensibilities, right? So, you know, I, I, think, that's, I think that's a major problem mistake with our people who are uh, Ahl Sunnah and our teacher. They may not say it blunt like that, but they're not, they're not pinpointing and targeting the grassroots from our people. And it's the grassroots who are more affected by this than anyone else. And there's more people at the bo bottom than at the top. All right, good. All right, so email name, could you translate that for me first before I try to answer? Translate what? Oh, I kill five statement. Yeah, yeah, that's a little bit too deep for me. Way above. How can we? Level. How can we get our people to accept the meth habs? That 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 meth habs are required when people just you know uh, watch YouTube videos and listen to uh, good speakers, you know, or who most of whom are Wahhabis or default Wahhabis under the context on in, in the guise of Quran and Sunnah, because saying using the phrase Quran and Sunnah. Is it seems it seems real authoritative because the ultimate source of everything is the Quran and Sunnah, and they say the Wahhabis say that they're following Quran and Sunnah, so that sounds real good to unsuspecting people. Teach them about our tradition. Teach them about the scholars of our tradition. Teach them about the books of our tradition. Teach them about the chains of narration of our tradition. Teach them the methodology of Ahl Sunnah wal Jamaa. And then when they learn that and they see the level of scholarship and they see the reading and the research that is involved in it, and then when they look at those little 20 page, 100 page, 200 page shiny books, they're gonna laugh. But first you have to show them what is Ali Sunnah and its methodology and its books and its scholars and its chains of narration. Once they see that, and then they're going to say, oh, this is child's play. But until they learn that, the slogan Quran and Sunnah sounds great because they don't know what Quran is, nor do they know what the Sunnah is, nor the necessary information it needed to understand it. So you got to show them that first. Once you show them that if they have intellect, they're going to know this is nonsense. But you got to show them first. They've never been shown. No one as a moving move as a movement has shown our people the truth. They always water it down for us. It's the black folks, you know, give them something. It's, it's blacks. Come on, we don't have to give them a lot. Give them, you know, just a little bit. They're good. They're gonna follow. Don't worry about it. They're not gonna learn. Just give them a little bit. That's the attitude. Change their attitude. As the old sayings goes, they still using it. If you really want to teach, you want to hide something from blacks, put it in a book. Let's start reading books. Let's start researching. Let's start having vast libraries. That's what we need to do. Right? That's what we need to do. Once we do that, they ain't going to have a leg to stand on. And when all of us who know, all of us who know, Stop tap dancing. Stop changing the dialogue so you can get a paycheck, so you can be in the pocket of people who just want to use you for their politics and you need their money because we don't support each other. So therefore, if you're asking guys who rely on somebody for their money, they're not going to tell you. It's going to get them kicked off the payroll. I'm not doing that. I know what you're saying, Imam. You're right, but I got to get my paycheck. Can't do it. My family got to eat. I ain't go overseas all them years and study to starve. And listen to you. They ain't giving me no invites. I'm not getting no big honorarium. I'm going to get treated like Kanye and Kyrie Irving. I ain't doing that, bro. I know. I, fight your fight, bro, but I ain't with you. 
I, I agree behind the doors. I agree. Go get them, shake. But I ain't doing that. When we stop that stuff, then we can change. Ibn Taymiyyah wasn't a Sufi. Okay. I'm mistaken. I need you to go read his compendium of fatwas and go read that big, large Ibn Taymiyyah work that Ibn, Ibn, Ibn Abdul Wahab never wrote such a thing. Go read it. He got two, two complete books on Tasawwuf and Suluk. Mr. I, Ibn Taymiyyah wasn't a Sufi. You go read it and I'll show y'all tomorrow morning. Now I got to go to the masjid to get that book. I can show you tomorrow morning that he believed in Tazawuf. Let me explain to you, oh ye follower of Ibn Taymiyyah who don't follow Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah wasn't against Tazawuf. He was against extremes in Tazawuf that he considered. You're mistaken, son. He wasn't against Tazawuf. He was against what he considered excesses in the name of Tazawuf. You're mistaken, son. He wrote complete books on it. But I know in your 10 years in Egypt, you didn't come across that. I understand. But when you come visit me, I'll show you so many of his statements and books in Tesowulf. I'll share it with you. Welcome, come, come, come. You don't gotta stay on the internet talking junk. Come, we'll do it together. All right, go ahead. Do you used to see those sparring fights with Muhammad Ali when he used to do those exhibitions? He'd be out there playing, having fun. Y'all remember those? That's my version of Muhammad Ali. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's basically it, Imam. So, uh, All right, we're done. Uh, how did we hit our goal? Or uh, Of course. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Well, we thank Allah. Last update I read said we was... Uh... $60 short, but we'll get it, inshallah. Now, somebody, I've seen somebody said that they yeah, made a price. They can send it. So may Allah so dare most of the reward. Please, honestly, I'm going to be honest from my side. I need y'all to understand something from my side. This is from me. I can't speak for the other imams. They can speak for themselves. I used to be in the strict, hardcore student of knowledge, scholarly mode like hardcore for years, but I was way over the heads of my people, the ones in my circle. They couldn't follow me too much, right? Arabic, trying to do all that stuff, and they still Wahhabi at the end of the day because the Wahhabis made it simple. Follow Quran and Sunnah and you're good, like Fahd was, uh, like Akil was mentioning. So what I've learned over time is that tone that stuff down, relate to, relate to people on their levels. Have a little fun. Don't go crazy, but have a little fun. Engage them. While you're teaching them, engage them. Because if I go too strict, it's going to go, it's going to go above their heads, right? And then it's going to be just like, you think you smarter than everybody and you're going to get that joint, right? Like they say, don't talk to him. He's going to trick you. You know Arabic too. How am I going to trick you? You know Arabic better than me. How am I going to trick you? Oh, see, that's all the game. Because forget it, I'll just shut up and put the books in front of you and you read and you translate. That's it. I'm, I'm going to be quiet. All I'm going to do is book after book after book after book and put it in your face. You do all the translating. I don't got to say, I don't have to say anything. I'm going to just put a book in front of you. Read that, read that, read that, read that. Translate that, translate that, translate that. And then you'll see what happens. Since I'm a, I'm a magician and I'm a sorcerer and I'm, I'm a trick and I got a, 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 a soothsayer's tongue with all that other crap, okay, I won't talk. You do it. I'm just going to share it to you so you can't hide books. I'm going to just put the books in front of you. That's all I'm going to do. I'm going to put the chains of narration in front of you. I'm going to put the books of Hadith in front of you. I'm going to put the scholars of Hadith in front of you. I'm going to put the scholars of Arabic language in front of you. And you do all the translating. And when you go left, I'm going to catch you. I'm going to pull you right back. Hey, 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 hey. That's not what that says. Fix it. You do know Arabic. You know that's not what that says. Fix that. Because if I know it, and you're better than me in Arabic, so I know you got to know it. 
So what it breaks down to is you hiding something from us because you do know it or you don't know. And I'm going to show you no problem. So it ain't, it's not for us. Seriously. It's just straight out lying to us because some of them know they just won't tell you they bought hook, line and sink. They own the, the, the men hatch, some of them on the payroll and they got to do their thing. It's business. And you, the commodity, you're the product. That's it. That's what it is. Nothing more, nothing less. It's not like they don't know. If they talk, if you hear them say Imam al Nawawi said, that means they know what Imam al Nawawi believed. They read his books. They got the book in front of them translating. They study hadith. They read Ibn Hajr's books. Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani. They read the book. They know what's in the book. They're just not telling you. They're doing selective editing. They take out what doesn't fit their minhaj and give you the rest. You know, fish come with bones, you know. Some people think fish don't have bones. Fish come with bones. Somebody took the bone out and gave you a fillet fish. It really come with bones. <laughs> if you get my point. All right. Yeah, I think this is good to stop here, man. All right, let's stop here. I said we were going to go three hours. I knew that was going to happen. Yeah. All right. So now we got enough enough information that they can run off of. And I don't think no one here is confused after this. Unless they just want to be confused. Because now you got enough stuff, especially with that beautiful PowerPoint, you got enough stuff to look at. Now, answer what's the question. There's another question coming. Y'all best off gaslighting me, man. <laughs> no, I think he was talking to oh, yeah, he was talking about something else. Oh, okay. So I right, go ahead. I'm so in closing. Imam Amin, entertain us with your dua in closing. I don't have dua, I am too stupid. I think Ibn Taymi is a Sufi. You know I don't know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> so uh um, you know, mashallah. It is what it is. But you know what I like? This is what I tell you what burns me up the most, right? I'm telling you, it really irritates me because I agree we're not qualified to do this, right? But the only reason we're doing it because the people of who are qualified don't do it. For us, all of our big learned people who know what we're talking about, and they have the academic, they have the nice clothes, they have the PhD, they have everything they need to come help us. They're busy doing something else and it's left to the ghetto dudes to do the job. I wish it wasn't like that. It just happened to be like that. And all that stuff we talking about is in our neighborhoods. It's to our relatives, our friends and our families. While you riding high, hanging in the suburbs, we are under attack. So we got to do what we got to do. We ask you, you know that. We'll say, yo, come on, come on the platform. Let's kick it. We're not running. We're not hiding. Come on, let's go. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And you say, I don't do that. I, am, I have too much adep. <laughs> All right, well, we got to do it then. But we got to get the cure. So either you gonna help with your sophisticated big language or we gonna do it with our ghetto tone. Pick your choice, but it's coming out. Yeah, with your improvisational language. Yeah, it's a little bit too, you know, <laughs> we, we ain't there. I ain't, man, we ain't even graduate. We went to, you know, the joint to learn, right? That's that's where we got our English, except Imam Naeem. He was one of the special kids. <laughs> yeah, I graduated high school. <laughs> I got All right, higher man, learning. Man, let me stop having fun. I love y'all. Y'all know what we do. Every day we're doing the same thing. <laughs> This is our time to relax and have some fun while we educate you, right? Because we're still educating. It's not just about entertainment. It's not even entertainment. We're really trying to get your attention to teach you something. Like Ibn Taymiyyah wrote a whole book on the soul. Right? <laughs> All right, go ahead. You know, some editions, they take that, that, that book out. You know that, right? Not in my editions. I got them. I got them, I so somebody say, you know, I remember when I be sometimes when I have to get Wahhabi books for research, 
They'd be like, why are you buying them Wahhabi books? Because somebody going to come one day and say this didn't exist. Here it go, right here. Not, 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 not. You're not going to teach and nobody know. Nope, here it is, right here. The book is right here. Now you can explain. Last time I know, a tesowuf means Sufism. Isn't that what it means to you? Yes, sir. I don't know. They might got a new word. No, Tesowuf really don't mean what he was talking about was, you know, um, Tesquia. Well, why didn't he say Tesquia? Why did he say (laughs) Tesowuf? Right? (laughs) Why didn't he just say Tesquia? If that's what he meant. Oh, he said Tesowuf. And then he mentioned well-known Sufis like Junaid al-Baghdadi, like Al-Harth al-Muhasabi. He mentioned them in his book. That wasn't about the Sowuf. He mentioned the Sufis. Maybe I can't read. I'm, you know, since I don't know English, I definitely don't know Arabic. So maybe I need someone to read it for me. And I'm welcome. I like bedtime stories. <laughs> Sufi. S O O F E E. Sufi. <laughs> okay. All right. Who's closing this out? I'm done. Imam Fahim. He got to close this out. He got all the barricade with that with that PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, and that's that should be the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, we want to uh, you know thank you all for this extended version of the Black Man's Roundtable. We do hope that it was beneficial. Inshallah, we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to accept it. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta sami'ul alim. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika ashadu wa la ilaha ila anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk al-Fatiha. Fatiha. And we're not allowed to miss class tomorrow because we stayed up late. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Lord,